It is three minutes after ten and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Did you hear that Vauxhall story? I, I said to you yesterday, I didn't know the Vauxhall story was going to drop, by the way. Um, I, I said to you yesterday, what these clowns don't understand is that if we don't follow EU regulations, we will not be able to sell our goods into the EU, which is our biggest marketplace. And lo and behold, up pop Vauxhall today, or, or, or Stellantis, I didn't know, it's so hard to keep track, saying that precisely the same thing. Under the terms of the deal negotiated by David Frost, who got a peerage for his um, reward under the terms of that deal, it's going to be a 10% tariff on selling cars into what has been for decades our largest international market. Well done, everybody. I, 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 don't, I can't do another hour on the B word today, but goodness me. That, that hour yesterday, quite moving, wasn't it, with people just calmly and uh, creating a safe space for them to do it in, calmly explaining their regret and, and, and their remorse. And I, 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 I mean, I suppose there'll be even more people today. If you believe what David Davis said about cars, remember Project Fear, saying that the car industry would be negatively affected. And then, Nick, they're playing at the end the words from Minette Batters of the NFU. Jacob rees told you food would be cheaper, didn't he? I remember. He categorically told you that food would be cheaper. But here we are, Vauxhall threatening to move out of the UK altogether, food inflation going through the roof, and the chairman of the NFU warning that things can only get worse. Whew, but remember, whatever you do, do not suggest for a minute that people didn't know exactly what they were voting for. Um, everyone's a critic. Listen to this. Two texts in already. Why you're not at work, James? Feel snooty to people working from home. I don't know if that's implied with, you set, with your setup for the topic. You're right. I should have said, why aren't you working? Uh, and then another one, the fake setup again. Gove will be the bad guy in an hour as you fake get your opinion changed by callers. It's an early contender for an idiot's corner. Can you imagine being so boneheaded that you think it's actually impossible for other people to change their mind? So bigoted and stuck in your uh, one-track life are you that you think anyone who is capable of keeping an open mind and changing their views on subjects must be lying or, or, or insincere or inauthentic in some way. That's quite tragic. We need a new corner, tragedy corner. Idiot's corner seems, I don't know, too flippant for some of my more challenged contributors. It's called tragedy corner. I don't know. But I still haven't decided what topic to do. That's why I'm meandering around the place and burbling meaninglessly. What do you mean you do that every day? I most certainly do not. I usually have a fairly clear idea at least of what the topic under discussion is going to be, even if I haven't yet arrived at my question. Renting or, 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 or sick notes? Sick notes or renting? What do you reckon? Should we have a vote? It's got to be renting, hasn't it? OK, why didn't you want to talk about renting? Answer, because it might cast Michael Gove as some sort of hero. I, I, and I've made a democratic decision, don't worry. You can put your hands down now. We're doing renting. More than 10 million renters will no longer face the threat of no-fault evictions. There, I mean, there are two elements to this story that intrigue me. There'll be more, no doubt, as we discuss it. But the, the first is that it casts Michael Gove in a very positive light, despite the fact that yesterday he was at that Nazi rally where all sorts of incredible... Um, uh, comments are being made. I don't know if you if you heard that someone called Douglas Murray trivialising the Holocaust. That's a criminal offence in uh, Germany. Uh, yeah, whether you're aware of that, David Starkey's there today, making some incredibly uh, obnoxious comments. I, I don't know whether that was the plan to get this sort of PR, sort of Nuremberg levels of of, of PR. But but there it is. Um, and maybe the name was deliberate as well. They knew everyone would start calling it the Nazi rally. But uh, that was part of the plan too. If you've got speakers trivialising the Holocaust, it's just a very short hop, skip and a jump to revelling in, in being called the Nazi rally. But that's, that, that's unfolding today. I mention it only because Michael Gove spoke there, which one has to imagine he probably had some reservations about when he'd seen some of the other contributors to the, to, to the, to the pageant. A bloke called Danny Kruger uh, standing up and saying that Marriage between a man and a woman and, and raising children is the only way in which families should, should be operated. I mean, really kind of weird stuff unfolding in plain sight in the United Kingdom. And then Michael Gove pops up on stage being thrown various underarm questions by, I don't know who the interviewer was, but they weren't, they weren't very good. Um, I mentioned that only, only because he was there yesterday. So any, any, any application of halo to Michael Gove today... Um, any halo will be quickly tarnished by the knowledge that he uh, spoke at the Nazi rally yesterday in central London. The, the point, though, the second bit that I like about it is it seems quite anti-Tory to me. 
I suppose by definition, doing something for the for the good of the population is quite anti-Tory. The Tory position being look after the rich people and everyone else can sod off. Um, it seems quite anti-Tory. There are two million landlords in this country and 10 million renters. I would have thought that the, the, the landlord class would be disproportionately supportive of the Conservative Party. So uh, these plans seem to me to be alienating people more likely to vote Conservative than not. But on the other hand, possibly this great delivery of, of rights and benefits to renters may send political pendulum swinging in the opposite direction. Michael Gove may be signing up new generations of supporters by dint of his rental reforms. Um, nine minutes after 10 is the time. It's section 21 of the Housing Act, essentially, which gives landlords the right to remove tenants without any justification whatsoever. But there's more to it than that. Landlords will be able to increase the rent once a year under the legislation. They will have to give tenants two months notice for any such hike. So you can only do it once a year and you have to give two months notice as well. Um, and crucially, you will not be able to evict people without a jolly good reason. Michael Gove said too many renters are living in damp, unsafe, cold homes, powerless to put things right, and with the threat of sudden eviction hanging over them. Our new laws introduced to Parliament today will support the vast majority of responsible landlords who provide quality homes to their tenants, uh, while delivering our manifesto commitment to abolish Section 21 no-fault evictions. Um, so I think that we will do the topic through the lens of Michael Gove's involvement. I, 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 that, that, I like that element of it because we spend most mornings putting the boot into this absolutely appalling apology for a government. And, and that's now with four in, aren't we, really? Maybe give Theresa May a bit of a break. Say we're three in. You've got Johnson and Sunak and the other one in the middle whose name I can never remember. Truss, Elizabeth Truss. I, I mean, three, what a hat trick of, of, of horror. That is, what did we do to deserve, oh, we voted for Brexit, what did the country do to deserve such a hat-trick of horror shows in charge? And what would you point to uh, as a policy that has succeeded? I don't know. I, Jacob Rees-Mogg this week reduced to claiming that Ukraine would have fallen to Vladimir Putin if it wasn't for Brexit. I mean, I mean the, the man's brain is now so boiled, there's nothing left of it. But Michael Gove seems to me to be doing something right, Okay. 03456060973. Does Michael Gove deserve a round of applause? That's today's question. For, for the rental legislation that he's bringing in today. And I guess the way to look at it is this. If you are a landlord, how do you feel about this? I am reading in very right-wing newspapers that this is a, a war on landlords. I see it more as a revolution for renters. What is the problem if you're a landlord with being told you can only hike the rent once a year, you've got to give your tenants two months notice, and you can't chuck them out for no reason whatsoever? Hit the numbers now, you will get through. I, I, what possible complaints can landlords have? Because I am told that they have plenty. I need a little bit of help in understanding what they are 0345 6060 973 and if you're a renter would you like to join me in contemplating the possibility of giving Michael Gove should we give him a mystery hour round of applause at the end of this hour if the if the consensus is that he's actually done some really good politics not enough of course to forgive him for being the co-chair of vote leave or presiding over all manner of problems in a, all manner uh, well, and also of course being a, a key part of Boris Johnson's support squad until he wasn't and then he was again and and then he wasn't and then he was again and then he wasn't i think he currently isn't or wasn't didn't he get fired for telling Boris Johnson to resign shortly before Boris Johnson resigned? What, what an absolute cavalcade of talent this lot are. But has Michael Gove done something really good? Hit the numbers now, you will get through. And if by the end of this hour there is a sense of uh, a majority, a broad majority, I'll try and keep note, I'll keep an eye on the text as well, I'll try and keep note, I'll try and keep a count, keep a tally, on whether or not Michael Gove has actually done some good politics. Just for balance, I should I share with you shortly the numbers of... You remember when Boris Johnson said he'd built 40 hospitals or said he was going to build 40 hospitals? I've got some numbers for you on how that's going. So 
just in case you think that I have had my personality uh, stolen and, and have come out of being uh, cautiously positive towards the current government, I can tell you that building work is yet to start on 33 of those 40 promised new hospitals. Uh, that's not even started. Uh, two, I think, are possibly finished. So that means that 33 haven't started, two are finished, five are currently under construction. They, they wanted to have six ready for 2025, but they haven't even got full planning permission yet. Um, so that's all going as you would expect. That's, that's conservative as usual. Is Michael Gove bucking the trend, f swimming against the tide of awful, the tide of sewage that has been both metaphorically and actually pumped into our waterways, the waterways of public discourse? Is Michael Gove onto a rare winner here? 03456060973 is the number that you need. The time now is quarter past 10. 10.17 is the time. Am I being a Muppet? Uh, asks John. I doubt it, John. If the landlord wants tenants out, surely they'll just give the two months notice to hike the rent an unreasonable amount and essentially force the tenants to simply move out by another means. The first, the first uh, uh, voice of caution before we give Michael Gove the clap at the end of this hour. Um, uh, let, let's find out. Uh, Karma is in Hatfield to kick things off. Karma, what would you like to say? Yeah, I think that we need to stop demonising landlords. Who's, who, who's demonising landlords? Often you hear on the radio. It's, it, even well, today, can we just we focus it? on the programme that I'm presenting, please? I'm, I'm not here to provide you with okay, radio so, therapy, okay, mate. So talk in, to me. In, so, in, so, in short, the rent reforms yes. are there, to, they say, to protect the, the tenant. The and, to, and to help landlords. Money. It'll be easier to get rid of antisocial tenants, Michael <laughs> Gove says. Antisocial tenants, yep. OK, so the tenants that don't pay and for a number of months or years can leave landlords like myself with large sums of rent deficit. Yes, that'll be easier. It'll be easier. So he's helping you as well. To, to some extent, yes. To some extent, no, until we see the devil. The devil's always in the detail. Well, um, the, that's cur true. The, the, the current system that we have now, the current system that we have now, allows tenants, in my experience, um, having tried to um, give a Section 21, it could take me up to a year to yes. get it. So when we often say that we give them 60, um, f um, 60 days notice, oh, that tenant's going to be kicked out. No, tenants are given l ample opportunity to either remediate the issue through some of the mediation um, points that are, are provided or to find alternative accommodation. You often get tenants, oh, I could disappear, I can't move. But we are in a country where there are there are houses available. They can find alternative accommodation that suits their requirements. If the land, I'm I, not. I'm are you sure? Wrong, are you think, sure? Are you sure that being yeah. a landlord is the right thing for you, Karma? You I've sound you sound very angry about it. You sound very I'm angry about angry. it all. I'm, I think within the past several years, all you've seen is change after change, and a lot of people discussing as if landlords are. Um, we're taking advantage of the, the, the lowest paid in society and so forth. Being a landlord is... No, a I'm, 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 I'm worried about your blood pressure, not not about your tenants. Mine? Nah, not, not, not my blood pressure's fine. Are but you I sure? Honestly believe, yeah, yeah. I okay, honestly good. believe that we need to look at the, the world in in the right way. There, You know, we don't... We don't Need to put and, and where I'm, I'm, and, and where where do you feel that landlords are are demonised? Because I, I mean, you'll be aware that eighty percent of the media swings towards the right, and and they would traditionally be very much the landlord class. I, 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 I some I, I rarely like to share criticisms of colleagues, but uh, but I'm told that even LBC may have been indulging in the demonising of tenants and the defence of landlords at, at some point in the I, last I, few I, hours. I, so I, where I, do you pick up on this demonisation of landlords? I think that we've been given. To Today, to some extent, a balanced view with respect no, to... No, I'm just asking where, where, where the demonisation is. Where, where is it? It's where, where, where we're seen as fat cats within society, overcharging tenants. Remember, no, but where, it, it, where it, is this narrative being shared, Karma? I, I, that's what I want to know. It's been shared everywhere. Yeah, well, you can't just say rent, everywhere, the reform, but, but the, where? The Rent Reform Act in itself, on right. in paper, often you'll see it splattered everywhere. Landlords okay. overcharging for rent. If for, for example, go up, so, just one okay, example. So, go on. So, one, so if rent, one, no. If rent's up, so okay. in, within no. society. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go what, ahead. What, one example. Can you point me in the direction of one example of that? Increases in rent. Yeah. If if, if food have gone up, petrol's gone up. The, yeah. ma the management cost to look after a property. So if a house is in disrepair, i.e., needs a gas fix or no, a no, I know all that. I'm just wondering where the demonisation is. I'm just looking for it. I can't see it. You don't see it no. in terms of making out that landlords are. Super wealthy people, individuals. But where that is are, that? 
living up pardon where is that where is that yeah in terms of where, where is that publicized in yes, terms of where, yes. where is it happening where, 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 where is this where narrative is happening most agencies that advocate on behalf of tenants have made it very clear even All social right. housing providers okay. have so made we're not going to get we're not going to get that landlords. i know that karma that is fine i i i i wish you were a bit calmer karma because this whole I'm landlord <laughs> i know you are i'm teasing but i i can't see any, at the moment, demonisation of landlords that, that, that you describe, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Sharif's in Dartford. Sharif, what do you reckon? Good morning, James. Hello. Great show, by the Great way. way. It's a bit so. early to say that, I'm sure, frankly. I've, I've only just got my feet under the desk, but thank you nonetheless. <laughs> no worries. Um, these reforms, I don't think they're helpful for anybody, to be honest. Go on. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that that means you're probably a landlord rather than a renter. I am indeed. Okay, how did I know that? Carry on with telling me what's wrong with them. Okay. If you, right, first of all, um, you bring all these reforms in, a lot of landlords say, you know, this, I can't take this anymore, I'm going to sell out. Yeah. Um, Can't take what? what, One one thing, one thing, one thing that we, another thing that we like to complain about in this country is that we've got too many foreign investors. Well, who do you think is going to buy all these properties when the landlords sell up? Because they're still not going to be affordable for the first time buyers. Right. Um, and the people are still going to be homeless. The, the, the removal of Section 21 for no-fault evictions, it, they, we call it no-fault evictions, but that's not really considering what other pressures, external pressures the landlord's selling, the landlord's selling for. The landlord might not be selling because he's just got a bad tenant and needs to get rid of them. The landlord, sorry, the landlord's not evicting because he's got a bad tenant. He's got other issues. So a landlord might, for example, be facing a, a huge... Uh, bill from HMRC. Yes, and, and he needs need the money fast. Money. They need the exactly. money fast, and it's an asset that they should be. I mean, I have some sympathy for that position because you're seeing it entirely as an asset. But remember that the other side of the coin is that someone else is seeing it entirely as their home. They are, James. They and are. If you've, if their you've home. run and up when, a big and when bill, you, uh, when, and when the landlord was able to provide it as a home. He did. Yeah, but I, I mean, but in they, the great scheme of things, if you've messed up your taxes. The idea that you get to take away someone's home willy-nilly, even if you own it, is not quite as straightforward as you seem to think. Morally, I would say. Uh, morally, but okay. Yeah. Let's say let's say that's the only asset that person has. So, yeah. should the person, what should the landlord then be subject to? I I then need to go and take a, a loan out to you, give to HMRC. Well, no. What you should have done is pay your taxes when you earned the money. Uh, may, may, however, that however that money became due to HMRC. Well, no, no, I think I think that's a fair point because really you're punishing tenants for your own financial you're, mismanagement. You're, you're, it's not necessarily mismanagement, James. It's not. Of course, it is. Mis- the money comes in, you put aside forty percent of it for the tax man. Even I know that, James. Let, let me say that is that, that is one of that is that is just an example I put forward. I know. Okay, that is an example. And I put it back and, again. And, okay, and yes. and the other thing is, Go on. let's say let's say. I have one house to rent in Hackney. It's the only house that's available for rent in Hackney. Right. You have the only house that's available for rent in Stoke Newington. Yeah. You accept pets. I don't accept pets. Yeah. Why should the law dictate that I have to take the person who wants to live in Hackney and wants to bring their dog? Right. Why? Why? Sh- why should that be? Why? Sh- why should that be? On because the you can't. You can't discriminate against pet owners. You can't discriminate. James, you discriminate against people all the time. Well, that's a bad thing. We should do less discriminating, Sharif. Fair enough. Can you go to Bentley and tell them not to discriminate against people that can't afford Bentleys? But well, that's not quite the same I, thing, is it? Yeah, if, you, it is if, exactly if they weren't selling you, you a, afford, if they weren't selling if you, you a car, doing, no. But the person with the dog can afford to rent your flat, Sharif. That's oh, a really silly they, example. Okay, fine. Um, they've if, got the if, money because they've done their taxes responsibly, unlike your your, your <laughs> landlord friend. No, but yes, that, that, and they've no, got a dog James. as well, so they've got you know that, that proves that they're quite responsible and they can look after another living thing. So that would make them a good tenant. Why no, do you hate that, dogs, Sharif? Um, I'm, I'm, I, I love. What dogs have you got against dogs, people. mate? You're like that copper the no, other I, day. I, I, <laughs> I love dogs as long as they belong to other people. I, I'm not. I'm not big. I'm not. I'm not, I I'm not a pet owning person. I haven't opened up that side of the conversation yet. So thank you to Sharif for being the assistant presenter this morning. One of the other things that Michael Gove is bringing in is a ban on elements of discrimination, which would be quite hard to do, I think. If you're an agent, for example, an estate agent, I mean, I'm fairly confident, even though you're not allowed to discriminate against pet owners, you're probably going to ask tenants whether they've got a pet or not. And you're 
landlord, the landlord whose interests you're representing, has made it clear they'd rather not have pets. What it means you can't do is chuck them out if they go out and buy a chinchilla, which happened to some friends of mine, actually. Uh, I, 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 and it was actually a chinchilla, which is a relatively small pet, but no pets allowed. So they're getting rid of that as well. As a landlord, does that really uh, annoy you? Because I can see why it would. Not a chinchilla, but what about an enormous Doberman? Don't at me. I know they can be lovely dogs, but it's a big animal. A big old Doberman is going to affect the carpets and, and, and what anyway. Nick's in Wrexham. So where are we on Michael Gove at the moment? He's not getting the clap, is he, at, at, at the moment? He's not. He's not Because we, we're being inundated with landlords. Nick's in Wrexham. Are you going to turn the boat around, Nick? Um, a little bit, yeah. Um, and I really don't want to because I despise Michael Gove. Um, <laughs> but just... Yeah. Um, just just to give a bit of context, I, I have spoke to you on this issue before, James. Uh, in 2017, I was subject to a no-fault eviction. Um, I had always paid my rent on time. I was a good tenant, got on with the neighbours. What um, did you think of Sharif's suggestion that that's fair enough because the landlord had a big tax bill to pay? <laughs> well, I hope, <laughs> yeah, I hope just... that the person before that um, is listening to this as well. Yes. Um, because I, I was laughing at some of the things they were saying. For example, okay. you shouldn't demonise you shouldn't demonise landlords for putting up the, their rent. Yes. Um, well, I, mean, I don't know any cases where when a mortgage has gone down for a landlord where they put their rent down. That's very true. Um, so you know, and that's then, very true actually. Yeah. So just um, and the other one as well as they talk about houses as assets. Yes. I don't personally I don't think houses should be assets. They should be for you know, for the social good. Um, but there you go, that's that's just me, that's something I believe in. And you might not um, say that if you owned a few. No, I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> so so it's always six of one. Um we're gonna run out of time. What so far, what do you make of the proposals, the Gove proposals so far? Yeah, Michael Go, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Um I was actually a Labour Party member who campaigned for no fault evictions within the Labour Party. Right. Um a ban a Wales. ban on no fault evictions. Absolutely, yes. yeah. Sorry, James. Yeah, that's all right. Um and they, they, they never passed it. They made it a bit more difficult. They gave people six months. Um and that was in the Labour Party and they're obviously meant to be the ones who are for the working class people. Um, and then Michael Gove has, has gone and done it. Um, well, they haven't been I in power for 13 years. I think it's been a policy of theirs for quite a while. Uh, they're saying in, today, they're saying today, the Wales, Tories, the Tor- oh, I beg your pardon, they haven't done yeah. it in Wales. Well, they could have definitely done it in Wales, couldn't they? And they, yes. and, and, and well, they haven't. Well, let's just say, I was a member of the Labour Party. And that was I enough. I campaigned for it. Yes. We, it was myself and a few others that put it forward. It was passed through conference. It should have gone through. And instead, all they've done is make it a bit more difficult. Um, for them to evict as opposed to banning it like they democratically should have. Um, and I think that Okay, Michael no, Gold... it's a vote for Michael Gove. You've taken me up to the news, Nick. To mind there no. you go. That's no, there you go. You are, you are. Nick, come back a minute. I'm making you temporarily president of the Michael Gove fan club. How do you feel about your new appointment? Oh, that's absolutely horrific. <laughs> um, it's coming up to half past ten. I just dug in a little further to the Daily Mail article about this. They've quoted someone from the Institute of Economic Affairs. Why? Why? Who is it anyway? What's he head of? Everyone there's head of something. Head of cupboards, head of paper clips, head of snacks, head of babby washing. Why? Why? Have you, I, mean, I, I'm not, I haven't read it yet. I haven't read what they've said. The head of babby washing at the Institute of Economic Affairs. I bet you 50p they've come out on the side of the landlords. We'll find out after the latest news headlines with Thomas Watts. 10.34 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I hope Jane is still listening, but I fear she might not be. So if you are still listening, Jane, this is a very personal appeal to you to turn your radio back on. I can't. That doesn't work, does it? I can't issue an appeal to someone to turn their radio back on if they've already turned it off. Do you remember when I nearly did a phone-in on people who hadn't got phones? There was a story in the paper about the number of people who didn't have a phone, and I, and I got halfway through saying, give me a ring if you haven't got a phone. That was quite a moment. Uh, this is what Jane texted. I love your programme, James. Well, naturally, Jane. And I listen as much as possible. Thank you, Jane. But for the first time, I've just switched you off for a bit. What? I'm a landlord of one property bought with my redundancy to help with retirement. I now want to sell it to help my kids with their property purchases, but you sound like you disapprove. Jane, I do not disapprove at all. I was a landlord once. I not, I wasn't a very good one. We put, put the property in the hands of a housing association, which meant that we made a little bit less money than we would have done. Uh, otherwise, but um, I didn't enjoy it. It, it, it happened by accident because we couldn't sell, or we hadn't sold the house that we lived in when we wanted to move into the house that we had bought. The only way we could keep the money uh, uh, flowing, as it were, was, was was to rent out the house we were in briefly, and it turned out to be anything but brief, but got rid of it in the end. The bit you've reminded me of, Jane, is that I don't know how much notice you would have to give if you wanted to sell it. 
And that does seem perhaps a little unfair. If, if I mean, you presumably can sell it at some point. There would be there would be a notice period, even if it's Section Twenty One, even if it's a no fault eviction. Otherwise, to have an asset, albeit that it's someone else's home that you cannot sell, does seem a little odd. So that's something we need to clarify. Brian's tweeted me to say, "Hey, I've been renting for ten years, James, and my landlord has never increased my monthly rent." Brian, shut up, mate. Get off Twitter. They've forgotten about you. Keep keep your head down, mate. Seriously, that could happen, you know. I, I, I just sort of if someone's got so many houses they've forgotten. Stop paying your rent. See what happens, Brian. No, that's that's a joke. That, that's got to be that Ofcom won't be very happy about that kind of advice. Given you're not allowed to give financial advice out on the radio, but to be honest, if you're taking financial advice from me, you deserve whatever happens to you. <laughs> Ten thirty six is the time, and a quick word to Simon in Bromsgrove. It's been in touch just to say, James, good topic and conversations this morning. Love it. Thumbs up. Thanks, Simon. Thumbs up back at you. Bobby's in Gravesend. Bobby, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Yeah, hi. I'm a I'm a landlord and I used to have a letting agency, which I've okay. sold now. So I've, I've got a, a bit more knowledge than, say, the average landlord on how this is all going to work. Yes. And um, this reform bill, um, I just agree with your couple of callers back saying that some landlords are demonised. I agree with a lot of late... Uh, sort of let, letting agents that are coming on, that this is going to be a disaster. Uh, why? Um, why? For two reasons. Yes. Because obviously landlord action and all these people are saying 27% of landlords have sold. But yeah. that's just now because everybody was holding fire. Everybody was holding their breath to see if the government would reverse it and they're going to sell. Um, and they're going to... But now what is sell, it you object to? What's the problem? The, well, two things. First of all, the Section 8 process doesn't work. Um, you know... I think we've had people come on. I've done quite a few Section 8s for myself. What's and a Section 8? Well, for renteries. If you're in renteries, right. um, you have to go to court, and then you get it. And one of the biggest problems landlords are going to face, which they're not understanding yet, right. is that even if they So there's two ways a tenant can disrupt that process. One is if you're... But I want to know what's changing it. today. I don't, I'm not... I mean, with respect, I'm not interested in old grievances and gripes about the current system that aren't changing. I'm interested in why you object to what is changing today, potentially. Because... Yes. Because that's yes. the whole point. Well, The whole point is, yeah. is that we as landlords, we were able to take a risk on certain tenants that we thought were safe. And if there was any problems, we can get our properties back. The current process doesn't matter what changes they bring into it. It's not going to work. And all these tenants that are are complaining are sort of happy this is going to happen. All we're talking about is the no-fault eviction. We're not talking about the eviction of people who haven't paid their rent. Bobby. No, James, that's not what I'm saying. No, that's I know it isn't. Saying. That's what, what I want you to what? say. That's what. That's yeah, the conversation yeah. that we're having. It's about the abolition of no-fault evictions. And the question is, what's wrong with that? Because, yes. so for example, if I had a, a, a European tenant who has been in this country for one year, yeah. and it was, which are normally they are good tenants, and you can take a risk on them. Right. But now, what's going to change, and this is what we're advising our family, our friends, yeah. is now we're not going to be able to take those tenants. The people that us were not quite meeting the criteria to pass referencing, we're now saying you have to earn a minimum amount, you have to provide a homeowner guarantor, and we're now telling people to put rent insurance. What, if people think this is a good idea, it's going to become 50 times harder to get a property to rent. Right, I don't understand why, anymore. from because anything you that you've get said. your house back. What? You, if you, when you had no fault eviction, yeah. if you had a tenant who moved in in the first six months and they trashed the place... Yeah. Or they were but that's not it, no you, fault eviction, is it? That's a fault eviction, Bobby. No, no, what you do is... You're chucking no, them out no. for trashing the place. No, hold on, James, James. You need to just hear me out. You're, well, you're I, not quite following what I'm saying. Well, no, but you're not you, saying... You're not, you're not, we're having two completely different conversations. No, we're not. We're not. We've I think we are, Bobby. Well, hold on one second. Right, if mate. you've got a tenant who's trashed the place yeah. and he's in rent arrears, yeah. First of all, what you do is you get your property back, you restore it, you re-rent it out, and then you build a tenant afterwards. Yeah. Now what you're asking me to do is go to court under Section 8 and try to persuade a judge to give me the money for it. And they don't give you the money. They don't. No, but this isn't landlords. changing today. It is because is... I have to go to court to get my house back, or how do I get my tenant out? How do you get, how do you get it back now? Well, I'll give him Section 21. Right, but that's no fault evictions that are being abolished. You're describing fault evictions. No, but you, you go... What, what it is, the no fault evictions is your safety net 
that if a tenant has gone into your house and caused £8,000 worth of yeah, damage... I know, we are at cross purposes. Michael Gove says he's going to make it easier for landlords to evict irresponsible or antisocial tenants and recover their property when they need to sell it or move in a family member. So if you can prove you're selling it, here's a loophole. You can pretend you're moving your brother in. You're golden. No one's probably going to check. They need to put quite a lot of balances in place, I'd imagine, to make sure these rules are being imposed. So you're the third landlord to come on and sort of speak about a different subject from the one that the phoning is about. Because I'll tell you why. Yeah. It's because we're ex letting agent. Yeah. Because we're ex letting agent. Because yeah. we understand what what you're failing. I'm talking about yeah. the current process that they're abolishing right. and the current process that they're going to leave in place. So why is Michael Gove, who would you would imagine lean towards the landlord class politically? Why is he saying that he's making the things that you say are getting harder? Why is he saying they're getting easier? Man, do you trust the Tory government? You're a landlord, you have to. No, well, I don't, because I know the problems. And one of the biggest problems we're going to face, and I'm just letting every landlord... I'm just not buying it. I, don't, get... I can't see that he's making life harder for landlords, except when they want to chuck someone out for no reason. Which, be honest, Bobby, come here a minute. You quite like being able to chuck people out for no reason, don't you? Oh, I, I don't, actually. We've yeah, got you a do. long history of... Bobby, you do. No, yeah, James, Bobby, just... Bobby, because you, you do. Because a lot of landlords get scared. When a tenant starts playing up, yep. they have to think they've invested their life savings into this. This is for their children's future. If you get a tenant that you know is not going to pay the rent, or you've got a tenant that's trashing the house, which is very common for all your tenants who come on here and say that we're all good tenants and that no tenant ever wrecks the I place. haven't had any. I've, I've been bombarded lying. with landlords. I've only spoken to one tenant so far, and he was no, in Wrexham. I, I listen to LBC across the board, and all tenants come on and say we're How have I ended tenants. up being the flipping one-stop shop right. for landlords? Right. How did that happen? All right, well, let's talk about this pet thing. It's my fault yeah? for such a huge audience, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, but you talk about the pets. Pets trash the house. They, they claw the Why do you hate off. dogs? Why do all landlords hate dogs? Because who's going to pay £2,500 to refurbish the carpets every two and a half years? I, I have some sympathy for that position, actually. I, 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 I can be torn on that. I say discrimination against pet owners. People love their pets, Bobby. You know, they really love their pets. And, you know, saying you can't move into this property unless you get rid of your pet, that's quite cruel. But on the other hand, it costs you some money to replace the carpets. I, I guess it's, it's about what you love more, your dog or your money. Zach's in Falmouth. Zach, what would you like to say? Uh, you were talking about demonising landlords. No, I wasn't. No one was demonising. Well, everyone keeps it. talking <laughs> about landlords being demonised, but no one's actually doing it. Uh, well, people don't realise that, you know, if you're a good landlord... Are you another sponsor, landlord? I'm a landlord. This is outrageous. Why am I only getting phone calls from landlords? Because they uh, maybe want to discuss the subject. Yeah, but I want to talk to tenants. Ah, oh, well, I can't help you there. No, it's all right. You fill your boots, mate. Go on. Well, no, it's just people demonise landlords, but they don't realise... Who's demonising landlords? You mentioned it in a couple of callers ago. Yes, I said no one's doing it. Well, it's quite just, a It's just like job, a symphony of landlords ringing me up with the world's tiniest violins. It's ridiculous. Oh, no, no, it's not a violin. Oh, I just, thank you goodness. Know, if, 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 you, if you take pride in any job you do yes. and take responsibility, then obviously people only see the good bits of it. Yes. They don't, they don't see the sleepless nights, the stress, the tax bills. You know, the government you, takes more than more You are tax. playing a violin. No, I'm not. I'm just saying, you, you know, if you mention the... You're saying, I'm won't somebody saying, think of the landlords? They, no, people don't realise that they think... Well, they do now. The park, I'm only getting calls off them. They think it's a walk-in-the-park job, and it's only for the privileged. You start from nothing, and you build a portfolio from hard work, stress, sleepless nights, yeah. and they think it's a walk-in-the-park for like anyone that's good at what they do. Exactly. And they well, I, I mean, if anyone was demonising landlords on this programme, that would have been a, a very welcome re redress of the balance, but they're not. Well, only because one of your callers called in yeah, and I mentioned... Know. But that was a landlord complaining about being demonised. So it's yeah, essentially um, the same call as this. But I've taken this call four times today. Sex, yeah, not with my voice. Well, that's um, true. You were talking about Section 21. Yes, I, I, well, that's I, true. I that bit's true. I, I was. see it's, um, it's a favourable favor thing, you know. Ob obviously, if a tenant is a bad tenant, fails to pay, messes up your house, yep. with good reason, yep. they should be evicted. Absolutely. Um, obviously, if they're, you know, a good... Oh, Blameless. Under, circum under circumstances, you know, a bereavement or you have to free up the equity in your property, yeah, I understand that. 
but to kick them out for no reason, make someone homeless, no, that's, that's not on. No, well, there you go. So we're agreeing on that one. 10.45, slightly surreal turn this hour, I think. I'm not quite sure why, but um, I'm finding it very engaging. 0345 973 is the number you need. That's, that's the first landlord who's not cross about the current... Um, uh, about the changes that Michael Gove is is mooting. I guess we'd need a little bit more detail on precisely what he's doing to make it easier for landlords to evict irresponsible tenants, i.e. fault evictions as opposed to no-fault evictions. But um, uh, I said I'd tell you what the Institute of Economic Affairs had to say about the subject. Uh, God knows why anyone would be interested, but the Daily Mail have phoned them up and they get their name in the paper yet again, uh, despite, of course, being the organisation widely regarded as being behind Quasi Quarteng and Liz Truss's mini budget that cost the country about 30 billion quid. But let's find out their expert view on this matter. Uh, landlords will inevitably be more selective about who they offer properties to and charge higher rents when they cannot quickly evict bad tenants. That is, yeah, I told you. So they're, they're, they're coming down on the side of the landlords, but they're probably pretending to care about other people. Let's see what else they say. Uh, that is likely to disproportionately hurt those who are poorer, younger and from minority communities. Because if you want someone to stick up for people who are poor, young or from minority communities, who, who else would you turn to but the ludicrously monikered Institute of Economic Affairs? 10.46 is the time. And you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Pete's in Romsey. I can't believe what I'm hearing, he says. The Tories have hoodwinked you. This helps big business who have the scale to deal with the risk of these new policies and kills the small domestic investor who may only have one property and who definitely does not have the scale. Hoodwinked James. P.S. I'm not a property investor. Um, Jonathan says it's a bit of a stretch to call being a landlord a job. And Cliff in Leicester says you're not talking to any tenants because they're hard at work trying to earn the extortionate rents that the landlords are charging them. Quite a few people have made that point as well. Stephen in Harris says you're only getting landlords as all the tenants are hard at work earning them money while the landlords are free in the middle of the day living off other people. That's demonising landlords. I won't have that on this programme, seriously. Um, and, uh, and ERA points out that landlords are saying clearly that they use no-fault evictions for the wrong reasons. They talk about the risks that landlords are taking, but not about the risks that tenants take of being with an unscrupulous landlord. It seems that there are a lot of them, and they seem happy to out themselves on the radio. That's a bit unkind. And uh, I do kind of agree with this one. These landlords talking about being demonised are literally demonising themselves live on the radio. It's quite remarkable. I don't know. I can't, I can't control what you hear. Uh, well, I can control what you hear, but I can't control what you hear. Here. Uh, Marcus is in High Wycombe. Marcus, what would you like to say? Oh, morning, James. How are you, mate? I'm good, mate. How are you? All right. Well, you'd be glad to know I'm not a landlord. No. Uh, Welcome. And I've got nothing against landlords. I don't, I don't want to be demonising no landlords. But carry on. What, what made you pick up the phone? Well, they're doing a good enough job themselves this morning. Yes. Um, well, no, I, I rang you about this, actually, back in 2019. Really? Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I got a no-fault eviction, my wife and I, well, my fiancé at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were, we, were, we were living in a property, um, and the landlord literally came around about um, six weeks before. I said to him, really like this place, you know, really love living here. We paid our rent on time all the time, lovely neighbours. And I said, you know what, to be honest, mate, I think... We'd quite like to live here until we're we're ready to buy a place. Actually, yeah, uh, you know we're we're committed to actually living here. Six weeks later, didn't even say anything to us. Just sends us a letter saying, "You know, you're I want you out. You're not on the list. Yeah. You're not coming in." Basically, and he said he wanted to sell it, and that was his reason for kicking us out. Right, and I mean, as is the case that so many of my friends told me as well. You know, almost everyone I know has been subject to a no fault eviction. Um, Despite what happens if, I mean, if they take, because that's, that's not going to change much, I don't think. If he is genuinely going to sell it, he'd still be able to sling you out. Yeah, but he wouldn't be able to say, I think I think from what I gather from this legislation, he has to wait till the end of our tenancy. Yes, that's correct. Tenancy, yes. You know, yes. rather than just giving statutory eight weeks at any uh, point. Oh, good point. Yeah. To get you out. That's it. So... You so know, that like, makes a big difference because it makes you, a huge you, difference. and you'll get more notice and you'll you'll. I mean, this is this, there's a tension here, isn't there, Marcus? I'm glad you've rung in. I was getting bombarded by landlords, honestly, um, because they oddly and and I don't like demonising anybody who doesn't deserve it, but they did all all of them, and goodness knows there were lots. They all seem to lack an understanding of the nuance 
behind an asset also being a home. And you've already you've brought emotion to this conversation already, uh, straight away. Now, I, I'm, I'm imagining what it would have been like to have walked in your shoes at that time. And it's a real rug from under your feet moment, isn't it? Literally. Actually. Oh, mate, it's horrible. And, it's and, and, horrible. and none of the landlords who've rung in so far seem to have much appreciation of that, I don't think. Well, I remember the, the night that we got that letter. Literally that night, I said to my partner, I said, this doesn't feel like home anymore. I just want to yeah. get out. Yeah. Like, I just want to get out. Because it doesn't. All of a sudden, it's just, it's just a building that you are in. Yeah. Because you've got no longevity there. And the other thing is, is we've got a cat. I love my cat to bits. Yeah. Um, and that makes, you know, this is another thing. I mean, I, I'm nearly being sick saying this, but this is possibly one of the only policies I've ever seen in the last, well, in my entire adult life where I've gone, that's actually all right. Yeah. Like, you know, from the Conservative government, like, because that was the other thing is you've got to think when we got, when we got given our eviction notice, mm. All of a sudden, we have to start taking every weekend out, going to look for new properties, like, as quick as we can, literally, like, the next day, yeah. trying to book places to go and see, because normally there's a bit of a lead time. You can't just move in tomorrow. So you've got to get all that sorted, got to get everything packed. We had to hire a van. We had to pay a deposit up front before we got our deposit back from yeah. the property we were being evicted. Yeah, it's from. a right old palaver. I think I told you at the time when I rang you, I think we lost about four and a half grand of our savings just because we'd given given such a short amount of time to move, and then the places that we were moving to, the rent was higher than... Um, yeah, of course it was. I mean, it would be. And it be. was where we were before. And and this is the thing that, like, you know, another caller said before, they never reduce your rent if their costs go down. The devil and is I mean, in the detail, but I think, I think we are heading towards giving Michael Gove a small round of applause at the end of this hour, aren't we, Marcus? Uh, it's on yeah, you. Okay. It's on you, mate. Guess, you could but, be the cast that you're like you're like uh, Joachim Phoenix in Gladiator. Well, my thumb's always to the side at the moment. All right, <laughs> the, th the thumb is to the side. Do you know, it was actually a, a, in ancient Rome. It was the other way round. The thumb, uh, the thumb up. Oh, I can't remember. I was reading it the other day and I've forgotten now. Someone will, someone will remind me. And, and I think that this text here possibly unravels what Bobby was trying to tell us. James, the reason landlords are angry is that they currently use Section 21 to avoid the more rigorous process of Section 8. They dislike Section 8 because tenants can fight it successfully if the landlord has failed to properly maintain the property, deal with damp, mould, etc. The Homes Fitness for Human Habitation Act allows tenants to sue for these failures, but landlords can currently retaliate with Section 21. Um, does anyone else hear a massive attack in the back of their head whenever whenever the word retaliate appears? You might as well retaliate. No, just me. Uh, and speaking of homes fit for habitation, there is an absolutely horrible story on, I think, the front of The Guardian today. And if I say the words absolutely horrible story, then like night following day, you will know that the words Suella Braverman are almost certain to come out of my mouth shortly. Um, seeking to remove basic housing protections from asylum seekers. So... That this is uh, a plan of Braverman's to axe regulations in private sector properties that would exempt landlords from regulations governing everything from electrical safety to minimum room sizes. That's that's Suella Braverman. I mean, it's almost like someone sponsoring her to be horrible, isn't it? As someone has said, I'll give you a pound every time you do something even more disgusting than the rest of this government. And Braverman says, yeah, I'll have that. I'll have that. Get your checkbook ready, folks. I'm about to remove all protections for landlords, uh, from landlords, electrical safety regulations, minimum room sizes, you name it. You can move, move them into a fire trap because they're only refugees. She's just disgusting. She was at that Nazi conference as well. Rally, rally. Stop calling it a conference. It's a rally. The Nazi rally that has been... Uh, unfolding in London this week. It's not over yet. David Starkey's there today, inevitably. Um, should we squeeze? I haven't really got time. Can I squeeze in Natalie in Taunton, do you think? Let's find out. Natalie, what would you like to say? Hello. Hello. Yeah, I, I, th I don't think this has got anything to do with landlords or tenants. I think this hey? is to do with Michael Gove oh. putting his foot in the water to be the next leader of the Tory party. He oh, come off it. He hasn't no, got a chance. I'm, I'm, well, I think he's been keeping very quiet for the last few months. He's gone into this right-wing situation. He's put out a policy which is... It was in the manifesto by. in 2019, I think. He's been working on it for a while. 
he hasn't been on the public eye. He's been keeping his head well and truly down, and he's put himself out there to test the water. There'll be focus groups all over the country. Seeing well, this is what the he is, he is housing minister. I mean, I, mean, I mean, if he wasn't housing minister, I'd probably give your theory a bit more credibility. But he's housing minister, and he's come up with a housing policy. It's hardly. I haven't seen him on the news. I haven't seen him on anything for months. Because he hasn't. He has, he's been working on this, hasn't he? Waiting to him for him to come out with something. And oh, you're a is. cynical old soul, Natalie, aren't you? That's Honestly. Silly. Can you blame me? Well, no, I'm frankly, I can't blame you. But he is the housing minister, and it's quite a complicated policy. So all the reasons you're offering up in defence of your conspiracy theory actually do the opposite. The reason why he hasn't been on the telly much is because he's been working very hard on his yeah, new policy. Yeah. I don't buy it. I he's the he's housing minister. What's he supposed to do? He's there to find out how this goes down, oh. to see if he can be the one to take the Tory party back to the middle. He's put himself oh, deliberately in that on. environment. Otherwise, Tory he wouldn't do that. Well, all right. I mean, I'm still going to give him a round of applause despite your attempt yeah. to scuffle well, at the final I'll hurdle. 18 months from now, we'll see what happens. Hey, I once said nice things about Matt Hancock. I wouldn't read too much into me saying a few <laughs> warm words about Michael Gove. <laughs> it's kind of come back and bite me on the backside just like my warm words about Matt Hancock did. But I don't think this is a leadership bid. They're all, they've all got half an eye on the prize, ultimately. But the Tory party in its current guys, Genghis Khan would have a better chance of becoming leader than Michael. Actually, that's Genghis Khan would probably walk it in, uh, in, 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 in its current guise. But there we are. Uh, 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 just a very small, can we do a very small little round? Just give Michael Gove a tiny little clap. Thank you. It's 11 o'clock. It's four minutes after 11 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I'm going to talk about facial recognition cameras now and I, I'm going to need quite a lot of help because I don't know anything about them and I don't have a very strong opinion at this point on, on the subject. Um... Quite a few of you are pointing out that giving a tiny clap to Michael Gove may well prove to be the kiss of death. Uh, uh, into political terms, well, we can we can only hope, can't we? And the more I read about this uh, element of the bill that's been tacked on, it would seem by Suella Braverman at a relatively la- last minute, um, is pretty grim. The, the idea that landlords wouldn't have to register with local authorities if they are housing asylum seekers, um, some of the most vulnerable people in the country, having what little rights they have taken away by Suella Braverman. And not, no one's surprised, right? Not a single scintilla of surprise among any of us. Suella Braverman's done what? Oh, she's taking rights away from people who don't have any. Or well, they have so, so few. She's got to have some, otherwise she wouldn't be able to take them away. It's kind of scary, that. And now we turn our attention. It's funny, actually, because the uh, select committee is looking at the policing of the protest. Graham Simpson, Graham Smith, rather, the chief executive of Republic, who was banged up despite having spent months negotiating with the Met about what he would and would not be able to do is there. Something a bit odd happened when we talked about the policing of the coronation in that I sensed a, 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 a lethargy or an apathy about the assault upon our rights. And the charitable reading of that is this, okay? It was a coronation. It was a really big deal. It was close to unique, certainly generationally speaking. And therefore, if the police went a bit too far, then we don't need to worry because there's not going to be another coronation for a a long time. And, And, you know, therefore, it was a sort of horses for courses type defense. Uh, The problem is, of course, that if they were similarly heavy-handed with Extinction Rebellion protesters, all the usual suspects would be queuing up to, I mean, on a non-coronation day, all the usual suspects would be queuing up to to back that as well. So I'm going to tell you that I am, when I look at Suella Braverman in particular, I am moving now into, into sort of Doctor Who villain territory. There is almost nothing I can't imagine her doing. The cackling manically at the site in Rwanda to which she wants to deport refugees so much she actually dreams about it. And that's real refugees, you know. That's that's not these so-called economic migrants or or whatever phrase they're using to further dehumanise and and minimise the trauma that these people have come from or been through. That that, that picture of her cackling at a site, uh, it was just hideous. It, It was utterly, utterly hideous. And news today that she's trying to take away rights from asylum seekers, covering things as simple as the electrical safety of the homes in which they live. I mean, it is, it is, it is horrible. It is, it's impossible to exaggerate how disgusting this is. And it's normal for her. And she inevitably has been giving a speech at the Nazi rally that is currently happening in London. Um, 
No surprises there. The one where this fellow Murray, Douglas Murray, has been trivialising the Holocaust by, by claiming that Germany mucked up nationalists. Just mucked us six million Jews dead. Just they mucked up nationalists. Quite spectacular what's happening under our noses in this country at the moment. And I'm deeply troubled by all of it. And then you throw in the police essentially throwing their weight around, never mind all the crimes that they've been found to have committed in recent months and years, but just the events of the coronation, exclusively the events of the coronation, were quite chilling, but I didn't feel the chill as much as I know I should. I had a tiny little bit of cognitive dissonance going on, if you like, in that I was holding two contradictory views in my mind at the same time. I, kn I know this is, this is terrible, but I'm not terrified. Do you see what I mean? It was odd. You'd have to imagine something you cared passionately about and then imagine the police going in, truncheons blazing, and then imagine being locked up despite the fact that you hadn't done anything wrong at all. And then perhaps you'd be able to muster up the kind of feelings that you should have been, that we all should have been mustering up. So I'm um, eight minutes after 11. I, I'm clear about the dangers of overzealous policing, and that's a charitable way of putting it. But I don't know what to think about facial recognition. I've changed my views a bit since I was younger. And, and I was on air at this period in my life. I, I used to be quite a serious subscriber to the if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear school of thought. I think I was even comfortable with emails being read. I can't remember. I sometimes wish I'd kept a diary back in the day. And part of me is glad. Because, of course, some of the stuff I would come out with as a, as a callow youth on, on telly or on the radio could come back and haunt me. But um, you're not allowed to change your mind on, on the internet. If, 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 if you said something in 1983, if the internet had been around, you'd still be held to it now, even if you'd spent the subsequent 50 years going, no, I don't think that anymore, I don't think that anymore, I changed my mind, I was wrong, I can't believe it. But I did genuinely used to subscribe to the if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear school of thought. And remember, a lot of my views on civil liberties were framed during the aftermath of the September the 11th terror attacks. And I think that had a much bigger influence on us than we realised at the time. I, I think that the... The, the, the way that that terror attack in particular, and of course subsequent ones, including the one in London, it shook our foundations. It shook the foundations of our relationship with the state, I think. It, it changed, whether we realised it or not at the time, it changed our relationship with security because we were terrorised. I know we get back to normal straight away and, and we are adamant that it's not going to change our way of life or, or how we live, but we were terrorised. That's what terrorism does. That's what it says on the tin. And, and part of the process of being terrorised is to be more fearful. And a perfectly logical response to being more fearful is to want more security. And a perfectly logical side effect of wanting more security is the surrender of liberty, of some liberty. It takes us back to, I think, Benjamin Franklin's slightly miss interpreted but very famous quote about those who are prepared to give up some of their liberty upon the altar of security ultimately deserve neither liberty nor security. I, I mean, he was talking about taxes, but it's a, it's a pithy little phrase and it does quite a lot of lifting, doesn't it? So if you're going to give up your liberties because you want to have more security and don't come crying to me when you want your liberties back, that kind of attitude... But I don't know what to think about facial recognition technology. The reason my opinions have changed, the reason, one of the main reasons I've moved from uh, nothing to hide, nothing to fear, is the realisation uh, that we could end up being governed by truly horrible people. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what do you mean end up, James? You've been talking about Suella Braverman this morning. And that's kind of my point. I, I look at Suella Braverman, and I, and I mean this more than any other politician. I know I, I'm pretty... Equal opportunities when it comes to putting the boot into the post-Brexit Conservative Party because they are utterly reprehensible and, and either devoid of integrity or devoid of talent. Um, or both, of course. But I, I, I can imagine Suella Braverman doing truly disgusting things to the population. I can imagine her bringing in incredibly oppressive legislation. If she's going to take away electrical safety regulations for houses in which asylum seekers live, what do you think she'd do to you, given a chance? Or to critics? Or to people in the business of speaking truth to power? There's about three of us left in this country with a decent-sized platform in the British media. What do you, well, I mean, look at her and tell me that you 
would put something past her. Because I wouldn't. I wouldn't put anything past her. Which is why my attitude to security has changed. So the first swing of the pendulum would have been the terror attacks. It were a seminal part of my, uh, not my youth necessarily, but my 20s and 30s. Seminal part. And then it changed again. When I saw Donald Trump get elected in America and I saw Boris Johnson get elected in this country and I realised, despite living in a liberal democracy, we could end up being governed by a monster. America did. We kind of had 52% buffoon, 48% monster. America had 100% monster. And what would Donald Trump do if he could get away with it? The idea that it couldn't happen here strikes me as incredibly naive. Um... But I still don't know what to think about live facial recognition technology. They use it at football matches. They used it at the coronation. I saw it. I saw some of it. Uh, uh, I mean, it, would it have been facial recognition technology at, at, um, at Brackley on Sunday when I went to the football? We were celebrating at the end and there were police there pointing a camera at the crowd. Would that have been facial recognition technology or would they have been taking pictures in case there was trouble later? So could I have already been facially recognised, if that's the correct phrase to use? But I don't know what to think about it. Um, Mary says, have you considered the possibility that Suella is a psychopath? I have, yeah. I don't have the qualifications to comment on anybody else's mental health. Um, I, I think that's a very odd thing to do. I use words like bonkers, obviously, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have the qualifications really to do a, a genuine diagnosis. But I have considered the possibility, certainly, Mary, as you clearly have as well. And that's the point, isn't it? What tools are you going to give to an office or a service that is currently one you might trust, but could tomorrow become one that you don't, and they get the same powers, they get the same tools. So, Professor Fraser Sampson is the Commissioner of Biometrics and Surveillance Cameras. And he, he's told The Guardian that, that what the government has got planned is very significant. The Orwellian concerns of people, the ability of the state to watch every move, is very real. It's a document produced for, the, for, for him, that discusses changes to the oversight of technology and surveillance. The issue is made more pressing given the policing minister expressed his desire to embed facial recognition technology in policing and is considering what more the government can do to support the police on this. So this would mean that police had cameras on their body-worn video um, that would essentially flag up your face but I still don't quite see what I'm supposed to be frightened of. Am I sounding really naive? Because if, I, if, if I've done something that means the police are interested in talking to me, then I've done something which means the police are interested in talking to me. All this does, as far as I can tell, is increase the likelihood of them talking to me, of them finding me. If I'm some sort of fugitive, why should I be worried? I'm not a fugitive. Why should I be worried about facial... Recognition technology. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. I, I, I'm conscious, I'm conscious of, of it feeling threatening, and I'm certainly not going to be dismissive of anybody trying to explain to me why it is threatening, but if you are not on a watch list, why would this be a problem? And if you are on a watch list, then... Surely the question is, should you be on a watch list? Not, should you be identifiable using facial recognition technology? Fraser Sampson says, a camera on an officer walking down the street could check the faces against a watch list of suspects. They could check hundreds, if not thousands of people while on duty. The technology will be capable of doing many things, not all of which the public would want. In China, the algorithm can pick up ethnicity. It will be able to estimate age. Some manufacturers claim it can estimate someone's mood or state of anxiety. And I'm, I'm just going to say, so what? And then you're going to tell me why it matters. All right, that's all. That's the topic. 0345 6060 973. Facial recognition tech in everyday policing would mean that if you're on a watch list, they can collar you on the spot immediately. What am I supposed to be scared of? Because I'm conscious that I probably should be scared, but I'm not. What am I missing? 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. You can, of course, also tell me why there is nothing to worry about. I don't know who I'm keener to hear from, actually. Let's find out. 
20 minutes after 11 is the time. So so there it is. A police uh, policeman, policewoman can walk up and down the street with a camera strapped to their chest that is tracking all of us, every single one of us, every single face, and relaying information back to the officer about you. It feels like it should be a problem. I can't quite see why it is. You're going to help me. Joshua's in Acton. Joshua, what would you like to say? Yes, morning, afternoon, James. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. What, what's going on? Well, basically, I... I just, I just, I, I don't agree with it at all. In the simple fact that no matter what government, uh, no matter what party is in charge of the government, whether it be Labour, whether whether it be Tories yeah. or Lib Dems or even the Green Party, I don't think they should have the power to give the police facial recognition uh, software to identify people that are going about their normal day to day business. I mean, Why in the simple. Because because we're supposed to live in a free democratic society. Yeah. People have the people have the right to walk up the roads to the shops. Obviously, if you're a criminal, you're going to have stuff to worry about. But if you're not a criminal, it, it, it's irrelevant because you should have the right to be able to go to the shops, go for a walk without then your face getting recognised by but, facial recognition. But why, what's then, the difference between you're being recognised by facial recognition or just being recognised by the local plod? Oh, here comes Joshua. Oh, morning. What, what, to, what, what to answer your question, James? Yeah. When, you say, when I see the local police, yeah. you're like, mate, how are you doing? You know, they're, yeah. they're, they're, walking, you're, they're walking the beat. You can have a conversation with them. They know you, in a sense, and you know them, in a sense. Yeah. But what this facial recognition system is, it's not, re- it's not really the police that are walking the beat that's going to have all this information. It's but what information, be... what information are they going to have? Well, if it's facial recognition software, then obviously, as soon as they get your face, then obviously they know your name, they know where you live, obviously they know where you was born, they know well, where you went to school, they, obviously then they they know everything about you. But the point is, they already know this in the well, that's, sense that's of, what I was about to say. <laughs> exactly, but why do they need to? But why do they need to take it to the just extreme? Just in case you're wanted. In case you're wanted, but yeah. the thing is, but the thing is, if you're wanted, right? Yeah. Then obviously you're going to have a problem. Like so, I said, all right, in the I, beginning. I, I, you've got, you've got. I, I, I can feel your philosophical objection to it. It feels like an infringement on our civil, civil liberties, on our liberties. Yeah. But, yeah. No, yeah. No, no, hang on. I get that. I get that. I'm not going to argue yeah. with that. But what yeah. is the, what's the worst thing that could happen to us, to you and me, as a consequence of this? The worst thing. Well, yeah. I, I don't really see like the worst thing. Or just anything it's bad. A, what's a bad thing that could happen to us as a consequence of this? Because we're less likely to be pulled over on, on, on a case of mistaken identity, so that's a, that, that's good. Yeah, yeah. No, you're so right. what's no, the you're bad right. thing? What's the bad thing that could happen? I don't necessarily think there's a bad thing that could happen. I just think that obviously this government over the last fifteen, twenty years. I mean, especially in the last two years, have been taking slowly, taking and taking more of our liberties away, and I think. That's the bigger yeah, but issue. What, 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 what liberty does this take away? I'm not. I'm well, being. Yeah. I'm being 52 percent devil's advocate. I'm probably emotionally. I'm probably closer to you than I sound. But intellectually, I can't see the problem. What? What is it that I should be frightened of? Well, this is the thing. What? Well, you know what? I don't think you should be frightened. I don't think anyone should be frightened of All right, their own worried, government. Then. What should I, I be worried about? What should I be worried about? Yeah, well, you, well, for example, right, you hear on the news all the time that you have, like, all these companies that are getting your data and whatnot. What's to say, for example, I know it's a long stretch, and I'm not going into any... I'm not going into any conspiracies or whatnot. But... But, but, but what's to say, but what's to say this person sitting behind the screen with all this information can't just take your information and be like, oh, yeah, look, I've got information on this person. So, for example, so, for example, there was a big crime lord, yeah, in yeah. Nottingham, right? right? And he and uh, he ran what the police called um, 
uh, the Bestwood Cartel in Nottingham. But for example, he had people that was working in BT and other companies. Well, hang on, okay, right? steady on. I, 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 that's fine. I know you haven't. You know, but, that's, but, 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 stop but mentioning said, companies. So, so okay. So, so, so someone bad could get hold of the technology, could access the technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but, like, and, and then they could find you. Okay. So, but that would be like using the the police computer, using homes illegally, or using uh, accessing AMPR. Police officers do sometimes get into trouble for doing that, for looking things up as favours for criminals or, 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 or for friends. It's not a massive reason to to, to, to oppose it all again, um, but I, 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 do, I do share the philosophical feeling of infringement, but I haven't got an intellectual rationale for objecting yet. Thank you, Joshua. 25 minutes after 11 is the time. Indy is in Burnt Wood. Indy, what would you like? You've got a new film out later this year. What would you like to say, Indy? <laughs> Um, good morning. Hello. Um, the reason you're not scared, James, yeah. is because you're a white man. Yeah. And this is going to sound really crazy, so bear with me. Right. So the whole facial AI thing, you have to train the AI, and you train the, the AI with thousands and hundreds and millions of images of people's faces, right? Yeah. And 90% of the population is white. So that yeah. means it's going to get really good at recognising um, and differentiating between your face and another white man's face. Okay. However, if you're a person of colour... It's going to be really, really, really poor at recognising the, the, the distinct. What are you basing features. this on? Uh, evidence. What? So I'm, I'm in the industry. Oh, so yeah. there's okay. tons of reports. In the, in the out industry. Of, uh, <laughs> I am in the. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm in the software engineering. It's not in the facial AI industry. Okay. But it's it's a it's a well known fact and a ticking time bomb. So you know, if you look over the, in the states where they're using it, yeah. the cases of misidentification for particularly black people are really, really high. Right. And so the worst thing you have to fear is a police officer who's only going by a computer saying yes or no, this is the person you want, you getting arrested, you getting put in jail, you can't go to your job, you might lose your job, and so it's a cascade of effects, all because you're relying on the computer in the first place, and the computer was only given a certain amount of images to train itself to recognise the bad person. Yeah. So that, that's where it begins to fall down. Um, and that's the really, really big well, issue. Listen, I just have to take your word for it. But um, yes, yes, you do. Yeah, the growing body do. of research you... exposes divergent error rates across demographic groups. The poorest accuracy is consistently found to be in subjects who are female, black, and aged from 18 to 30 years old. This and, and, is from and, Harvard and, and, a couple of years ago. And, and, it, and it works really well if you're white and a bloke. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's loads of pictures of m- male white people, right? Yeah, and, and, so, it, and, and now I, I, go, I go all in on my white privilege when I say, OK, so you, you're more likely to get pulled over incorrectly if you're a young black woman, but then you just take your ID out and prove that you're not who they think that they're looking for and, and everything's fine. And that's like an old white man it, saying that stop and search is fine because it never happens to it, me, so you can it, sling it, a young it, black lad over the bonnet of a police car yeah. whenever you feel like it. So it doesn't work because right. they're going to trust their they're going to trust their official police computer over any evidence that you have, right? You got the wrong blood. Yeah, they all say that. Get in the back of the van. That, that's it, right? So it yeah. yeah, exactly. So there you go. So that's where it begins to fall down, and that's what. It, it, all right, that's the reason. Because, that's the reason not yeah. to. That's the reason to be worried. Does it not? Does that problem not fix itself as time passes and as the technology? Because no, the companies no. making the technology, they're going to put it in no. in in, bla- in in majority black so, countries, and so the or software will 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 improve itself. The only place, the only place where it actually works on the population China. as intended is China. Um, so every now and then they they get a leak from the Great Firewall of China, and what in terms of technology, what they have is amazing. In terms of liberty and everything else, it's terrifying. But because it's d- d- developed by Chinese developers with Chinese faces, they are super super good at recognizing um, Chinese faces, right? Because the data they have is skewed heavily towards those kind of faces. Um, and then you get into the conversation with TikTok and everything else, and, and and how they're using that data. But it's really important to remember that data is really key as well as who's designing the the inform, information around our data so if you have if you've got a company you've got 90 percent white developers who are using 90 percent white images to train their essentially really accurate white facial ai recon, recognition then that's going to be super good for recognizing white super villains but yeah no. <laughs> 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 so, so okay. So, there's a reservation. I, the bit I don't understand is the bit about why it wouldn't evolve better, especially if China is an example so of it, it being brilliant. It wouldn't evolve. It wouldn't evolve better because it's it, it can only evolve based on the data you feed it. Like we're still learning lots about AI. So, no, I know, you know, but you feed it lots of data of black faces. 
Yeah, but but those faces have to come from somewhere, right? So mugshots, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. And if you're relying on humans to collect data, we already know that police All officers right. are much more likely to you know, arrest black people, stop black people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes. if the data set you're finding in, feeding in the first place is biased, the outcome is going to be biased. I mean, there's a fantastic documentary on Netflix which I cannot remember the name of. Oh, that's no um, good. Uh, so it, 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 I think it's like coded, coded bias or something like that. All right, someone will know. Someone will, send, someone will send me a text now. Yeah. I, 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 and that is a, that's a genuine concern. It's a, it's a major worry. And you're right. As a, I, I, I wasn't aware of that, but I'm reading about it. Um, as, as you speak, I'm sort of I've got one eye on the screen and, and both ears on the on the on your call. And it, I mean, it is a thing. I, I'm still not entirely clear. So you've got 42,000 gang affiliates in in, in New York. Um, 99% black and uh, Latino, with, with no requirements to actually prove suspected gang affiliation. It's just it's just like a record, a, a database. So you're more likely to be on these databases if you come from certain ethnicities because you're more likely to be in that kind of gang if you come. I mean, the gangs consist, they are Latino gangs or black gangs. Uh, yeah, all right. Um, we'll chalk that up as a genuine cause for concern. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. 25 to 12 is the time. Um, David Starkey at this Nazi rally has has said something that I don't think it's quite as bad as Douglas Murray trivialising the actual Holocaust yesterday, but it, it does also bring the Holocaust. It's so odd. Why are these people saying these things? And why are government ministers like Michael Gove and Suella Braverman turning up at this bizarre gathering? So this is Starkey. Uh, the reason that the left has such ire for the Jews is jealousy. They want to replace the Holocaust with slavery in order to wield its legacy as a weapon against Western culture. Um, I think they've deleted that one, so it would appear they are capable of shame. Daniel Sugarman from the Board of Deputies of British Jews has responded by saying, if this quote is accurate, such pathetic attempts to drive a wedge between communities will not work. Uh, the organisation I work for, the Board of Deputies, supports the building of a Holocaust memorial by Westminster and a permanent memorial to the victims of transatlantic slavery. It's not hard, is it? But too hard for this lot to grasp, apparently. Um, and remember, it's, 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 it, it, you can laugh. I mean, it is, in many ways, hilarious, the, the ridiculousness of some of the views on display, but they are also dangerous. 30p leads turning up there later today, um, like night following day. But it's that's why it's something that needs to be talked about. You can normally ignore these fascist adjacent provocateurs who are desperate for your attention, but when government ministers are sharing stages with them, it becomes a very different proposition entirely. Um, that is, that's probably the second most disgusting thing that's happened at this rally today uh, in the last two or three days. How long is it going on for? It seems to be endless. Anyway, back to facial recognition technology. Uh, Paul's in Bristol. Paul, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Big fan. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm really nervous, probably because I'm such a big fan. Well, it's possibly. only me. It's only me. I'm just um, some, some, some old idiot on the radio. There's nothing to be nervous about. Um, so I, I'm someone who I consider myself to be a sort of uh, a, a casual protester. I'm not a member of any particular group. I care passionately about the environment and yeah. civil liberties and things like this. But I'm quite a sensitive person, and and yes. I I can't handle being in protest. Um, I would love to be at more protests, but unfortunately the police create such a hostile environment in these places that yes. it, 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 it's a very emotionally and like draining and difficult and intimidating place to to occupy. And my my issue is like as a as an ordinary person in this country, I I don't know every single one of my rights no i and i hope the police do um it seems unlikely to be honest so some of them won't yeah because i mean they arrested charlotte lynch my colleague at, a, at an extinction rebellion or a just stop oil protest and they shouldn't have done that so either they knew what they should could do and ignored it or they didn't understand what their right what their powers were and their powers really are the corollary to our rights aren't they in a way yeah I, I, I don't know what the best case scenario is. Either they don't know the the, the rights and yeah. my rights, or there isn't enough accountability. But both of those things are terrifying. And facial and it, recognition it just, adds to your fears, does it? Adds to your it does reservations yeah, because, because we all know that um, anti-terrorism like technology and measures are already used against 
ordinary law-abiding protesters such yes. as me, people who care passionately about the environment. And I want to go and I want to shout slogans and simply meet up with other like-minded people. But you've got anti-terrorism sort of But it, they, they'd already take your picture. They're already, they'd already take your picture and have it on file somewhere. This just... Yeah. I mean, if I, this is... To my mind, at the moment, all this does is is enhance the technology that's available. It doesn't actually infringe any new rights or liberties. They can take your picture and keep it on file, and they might have a record on you as a regular protester. Tony Benn was always um, pointing out at public meetings, if you ever went to a Tony Benn public meeting, he'd always point out that there would be someone from the security services in the room, even if it was a, you know, a stop the war coalition meeting because they keep an eye on people that are likely to uh disrupt if you like uh, and and that, sure. that that doesn't take away your right to disrupt just because they've got the right to keep an eye on you this is just a different flavor of eye it's not a new level of scrutiny i don't think it is i don't think it is i think it's sort of coupled with like i i spend a lot of time in france before we left the eu i used to work a lot in france and we do, as a society, just have this sort of inherent disdain for people who stand up to authority. Yeah, like and then, yeah, the French attitude to protest is comple- just far, completely far more, different. And you, that you, we- you can be an upstanding member of society and attend the protest. Whereas, whereas here, country, you're going to get typified as some sort of crusty ne'er do well in the in the right wing media, and that inevitably filters through to to the British public. I, I mean, the best example being the environmental protest, where you know they're locking up vicars. And housewives and, and entirely respectable, if you like. Not that anyone is unrespectable in the protest movement, but, I, you know, the, the stereotype has been completely exploded, but still the myths persist. This idea that it's all unemployed, unwashed crusties. It's ridiculous uh, in the context Absolutely. of environment. And, and I think there's a lot of people who, who would go to protest. Who, lots of my friends are kind of passionate, but it's it's because they're too intimidating and because if it's there's a, yeah. even more powers to the police to monitor you and you're there and you're a school teacher but you're at an XR protest and yeah, well, this it, came it just up. becomes, you know, you say, look, I, I just, I'm not going to go. I just can't risk it because I don't know what the police are up to. So I'm going to play it safe and stay at home. Yeah, I, and, and of course, what we unearthed, uh, not, not not by accident exactly because it's the way the conversation was going. But when we were talking about the coronation protests the other day, of course, the criminalising of these people under Suella Braverman's bill means that you could lose your job, you could breach your contract, you could be accused of bringing the organisation into disrepute by doing something that wasn't illegal yesterday, but is going to be illegal tomorrow. And then that's why they've partly why they've brought the legislation in because Paul's Paul's call is incredibly powerful. So it's not necessarily about what happens on the street. But what happens in the minds of people who are deciding not to be on the street? You dilute, you diminish, you minimise protest by making people wary of protesting because either they're going to be clocked and collared or they could even be locked up for a few hours for doing nothing wrong. And I glance up from my screen and Graham Smith from Monarchy is at the House of Commons speaking to the Select Committee looking at the policing of the coronation. You can be locked up. Now, if he had a boss who was minded to get rid of him, but had no grounds for getting rid, getting arrested would possibly constitute grounds. And, and of course, getting charged and convicted of a new crime, protesting, <laughs> annoying Suella Braverman, could be even more grounds for getting rid. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Hamid is in Baker Street. Hamid, what would you like to say? I I, 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 has, I have been acting as counsel to a tribunal called Euro Tribunal, Uyghur Tribunal, okay. that investigated the uh, treatment of this minority in China. In, in China, yes. China, Chinese government used this technology and exactly the same manufacturer that they are signing contract with to use these cameras. And we had substantial evidence on the use of this face recognition. Among them, the person who was, of course, of Uyghur origin, who developed the God. concept that you can recognize the, the racial or also anxiety in the people. All this information was fed to an AI monster called Integrated Joint Operating Platform yes. that not only receives all the 
information from this, but also from the use of National Guard, from the use of text phones, the text, the texts on the phones, on the, the conversations, on everything you do in China like, that is connected to an electronic, including your National Guard that is required to be used, and your credit cards, is recorded in this monster. And this will, the monster can issue a warrant of arrest on its mathematical algorithm. In 2017, when it became operative in Xinjiang, it issued 150,000 warrants of arrest in 48 hours. Now, your concept of not being a suspect yes. presently can change very easily. That's the point, isn't it? Venezuela Breverman would say that. If you disagree with me, you're a suspect. Yeah. You can be picked up. Things had changed in many countries. I mean, it wasn't illegal in China to be Muslim, but now being Muslim considered to be extremism. So if somebody said assalamu alaikum in the morning on his phone chat to a friend, by lunchtime he's arrested, by next day he's condemned to 10 years imprisonment and dumped into concentration. And if, if Donald Trump can introduce legislation to, to ban yeah. Muslims from coming into the country, would he think twice about using technology to identify no. the ones that are already there? Absolutely. I mean, our democracies are always under threat yes. from this side. So you are, you're you're Hamid Sabi, I think, aren't you? You're, yes. You're, yes. Okay, thank you for ringing in today. The, the, I mean, you're obviously right, uh, and, and the... The principle here is is not what they will do with it today, but what they might do with it tomorrow. But does that not extend to almost all technology? I mean, almost every tool that the state has to surveil its people could be objected to on the grounds that a, a more sinister administration may be in place tomorrow. Therefore, the state should do nothing. Yeah, na naturally, naturally, this is true because... I mean, in China, they have used this to the utmost. Yes. Your yes. credit cards. You cannot have a phone that hasn't got the uh, special app called WeChat on it. So yes. whatever you use on that phone is reported to this monster. Yes. So you can you can reach that, that level of... Or Orwell 1984 did not conceive the situation like this. No, it was still human. <laughs> this it. is far more... Yeah, and I say, actually, in my closing speech in the tribunal, I said that it makes a child play of 1984. Yeah. So the, this is substantially worse than that. The state controls everything you do. And no, nobody can talk, do anything that the, the system doesn't see and doesn't put a mathematical value on it. And if it goes negative, you get arrested. You get the warrant is issued. Did, 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 yes. they, did they, they used it to identify physiological traits of, of, of Uyghurs, did they? They started, the, uh, the system started with recognizing anxiety. Oh, right. So they come, and then that led, according to the expert who gave evidence to the traits, yes. that led to identifying the Uyghurs, but it can identify Uyghurs, but not other for the time being. It hasn't been developed, but it was developed only to identify this particular minority and not the yeah. other <laughs> other groups. No, I mean, that, that, yeah, that they just need to feed the profiles into the machine, presumably, yes. and then they could affect a, a, a similar treatment of any other uh, identifiable minority as well. Yes, yes. So, you, I mean, I don't really need to ask you this question, I mean, you, you, would, you would say to British people, don't let them go anywhere near this kind of technology. No. no. These, these are all instruments that would be used eventually by a totalitarian government. I um, never assumed that we are far away from that. Well, I think you're, I think you're Iranian, aren't you? Is that right? I'm Iranian, well, yes, that's so, correct. So, you, you, I mean, it's easier, perhaps, for you to get your head around the idea the, of... The a, present government in Iran also has started using it and they are installing cameras yeah. in a very fast rate all over the country and they have promised that by summer they will recognize all the women who would come out without a compulsory hijab. Without a hijab, of course, without yeah. a hijab. So this, is, this is a terrible instrument, but as you said, it can be used. All the technology can be used in a negative way. I mean, Tabby, thank you so much for, for your contribution. I mean, I, I don't you take this the right way, but you've chilled me a bit with, with that analysis. And, and from a perspective of such experience and expertise as well, we, we were lucky that you were listening today. 
Thank you. No, thank, thank you. you. Uh, crikey. And now I sort of put my blooming big gob back on and start trying to say, well, it's not like we're going to end up like Iran, is it, or China? But how do you know? How do you know? How do you get the genie back in the bottle, if you like, with this, this kind of thing? Whew, it's 10 to 12. It is 11.53. Uh, PMQ's on the way. It's the deputies today. Why is it the deputies today? Where's, where's Rishi Sunak? He was hanging out with farmers yesterday, or sort of farmers, having some sort of food summit. And um, I, I think that Hamid's contribution is going to be hard to top, isn't it? If you weren't worried about this technology before, then you would be now. It does fall to me to point out that your 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 relationship with this technology hinges upon your, your your relationship with the political future of this country, the plausibility of uh, a, a, an as-yet-uninstalled administration in Westminster um, extending its conduct into areas that are currently being undertaken by the Chinese authorities. So I, I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd go with Donald Trump's Muslim ban, as I did while I was speaking to, to, to Hamid. Hamid Sabi is his full name, a few people asking, and, and, and he was indeed a, a counsel at that tribunal into the um, uh, treatment of the Uyghur people in China. But that, that, is the, that is the question, you know. How fearful should you be of the technology? Not the question, how fearful should you be of future governments, is the question. And if, if American elect a man that wanted to ban Muslims, then how hard is it to imagine him deploying this sort of technology to identify people from, a, from an ethnic uh, uh, grouping that he disapproves of? I mean, he was pretty rude about Mexicans, wasn't he? Or, or, or indeed anybody who'd come to America from South America, could, could you imagine Donald Trump deploying tech cameras and troops or, or police officers to find people from certain groups and then possibly order them to prove that they were in the country legally? Yeah, I can. Uh, Kenny's in Worthing. Kenny, what would you like to say? No? Is Kenny there? Nick's in Twickenham. Nick, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Um, I was just thinking about what you said at the beginning about the original opinion of what have I got to hide yeah. and thinking that as much as, I mean, I understand you changed your opinion. Since then, I feel like the, the question really should be what could they have against you? Yeah. And we're dealing with a known prejudiced institution. They've been recently reported as racist, yeah. sexist. Many people feel really vulnerable when they're dealing with the police. They've been, the policemen have been convicted of all predatory crimes. And now we're giving you know, unknown individuals, people we don't even know behind the camera effectively, within the police, real-time invasive information about us. Even we know that they're prejudiced against us, and they, they might have no real discernible rational reason to have these prejudices against us. Mm. But we as white men might not feel vulnerable, but if you accept many people do feel vulnerable, then do we not need to... And it feels pretty horrible to say this about a public institution, but do we not need to protect them? Well, uh, we're back to stop. We're actually back to, to stop and search, which is a much blunter instrument than facial recognition technology. But but the sort of smug righteousness of elderly white men talking about how it's perfectly reasonable for young black men to be treated as if they're guilty until proven innocent, a fundamental contradiction of the most basic premise of, 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 of British law. You're right. I mean, that Indy pointed out the privilege involved in this position, and also the technological bias. It's um, the, the, yeah. net, the Netflix documentary he referred to is called Coded Bias, and, and it has found that the algorithms do actually display a bias against certain um, uh, demographics, and, and that ties in with the established prejudice. So you've got the algorithm against you, and you've got the people running the algorithms prejudiced against you, or institutionally prejudiced against you. I, yeah, all right. I, I mean... I'm a lot more worried about this now than I was at 11 o'clock this morning. I, I sometimes wonder whether we should do these topics live on the radio because <laughs> I, I think Hamid in particular and then Nick just coming in to, 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 to finish up gives us lots of uh, pause for thought. It is coming up to 12 noon. It is Thursday. Not Thursday. It is Wednesday, which means that Oliver Dowden is about to have his first PMQs. Where are the, where are the cheeses? Ben Kentish Kentish is here. Ben somewhere Kentish over, uh, where would he be? The somewhere rainbow. over Eastern the Europe. Somewhere over the rainbow, yeah. He's John the Wizard. <laughs> Where's he going? He's on his way to Japan, James. Is he? He's on his way to Tokyo for the G7. So it's Angela Rayner versus Oliver Dowden. First time at PMQs, but not the first time in the House of Commons. Cabinet Office questions last week. Yeah. They clashed. It was quite a fiery exchange. So bodes well, we hope, for today's PMQs. But it is, yeah, the first time they've clashed at Prime Minister's questions. Why? Because, of course, Oliver Dowden, only in the last few weeks after Dominic Raab's, uh, well, 
well, I was going to say sacking, resignation officially, mm. uh, was appointed as uh, Rishi Sunak's deputy prime minister for the first time. So it's his first time doing PMQs. Big one for him. Big I'm one for Angela Rayner. looking Rayna. forward to it. What do you think is going to come up? You haven't got long. Hard to, hard to say on this one, James, because the obvious, <laughs> the obvious thing is housing. The yes. obvious thing. What Keir Starmer's team will want Angela Rayner to talk about is their... She gets a free arm, does she, on this? She's more or less free hand? She, well, she, this is the problem, that they would want her to talk about yes. housing, but she's got quite a long history of not necessarily doing exactly sure. what Keir Starmer's team uh, wants her to do. She's very independent-minded. She's independently elected by the Labour members. Mm. That said, I suspect it will form at least part of her questions. The other thing to watch out for, I think, will she be able to resist bringing up Jacob Rees-Mogg's comments about voter ID? Oliver Dowden is the Cabinet Office Minister as well as Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah. Responsibility for, for people voting. not aware, this is Rees-Mogg admitting that the Tories deliberately tried to suppress votes and it backfired because the votes they ended up suppressing were of elderly, yep. more likely to vote Conservative people. Gerrymander. Gerrymander I mean, incre- was, was the word he used. Yeah. Incredible admission, in- in- that. Incredible admission from someone who... Could have been career-ending in a cabinet. normal period of politics or, or certainly, certainly not, would have brought certainly some, not a normal era of politics. Speaking, speaking of, of, of despicable conduct, do you think she might pick up on some of the people that Michael Gove and Suella Braverman have been sharing a platform with at this Nat C rally in, in, in Possibly. central London? Possibly. Because it's escalated still further today. The Board of Deputies of British Jews outraged by something that David Starkey has said yep. on the same stage that Michael Gove and Suella Braverman have been on. Yes, David Starkey suggesting a tweet that's since been deleted pretty uh, disgustingly, I think many would say, James, that uh, the left doesn't like Jews because they're jealous of them. Comes just a couple of after days after another speaker from that platform suggests that the Nazis had just messed up in Germany, uh, Douglas mucked Murray. Up. Deals, this is one of Andrew Neil's house elves called Douglas yeah, Murray. Mucked up. Diminishing um, the Holocaust, trivialising the Holocaust, which is a criminal offence in Germany, I learned this morning. Well, it didn't go down well. And yes, there have been questions as to exactly why senior cabinet ministers were speaking at their conference. They say it's a battle of ideas. They say, you know, we don't endorse all the views. It's a discussion and so on. But it's quite a new phenomenon. It's a very mm. new phenomenon, actually, these sorts of conferences a national conservatism conference with loads of across people's the world, front of Judea, the US. Judean people's front mm. splitters uh, and Vauxhall. Would she bring up Vauxhall or is Brexit still the, 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 he sh- who must I not would be, be named? Amazed. I would be. Well, I might be wrong. I'd be very surprised. It's still, it's still something that's. I think housing. They keen to avoid despicable associations. Got all their albums. Voter ID. Bro- voter ID. Crossing. I mean, really, it is senior conservatives associating with people saying disgusting things or themselves saying outrageous things um so housing would be the safest option to go for brexit and Vauxhall probably not on the list this is Vauxhall saying the uk needs to change its brexit deal or we won't be able to carry on doing business here if only someone had warned us hey eh, about what was likely to happen in the event of this ludicrous uh, 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 uh political move anything else she might bring up Vauxhall, James. I mean, I think yeah. it's unlikely, but it, it, he's still saying this morning that he would want to renegotiate the deal. So it, actually what Vauxhall is saying is effectively what Labour Party policy is, yes. is that the deal isn't, isn't Food working. Food prices. And, and Food prices absolutely could come up. There's so many options. You're just saying yes to It's everything. all about how... I'm going like to bet on housing. I'm going to bet on housing. <laughs> Are you? OK. Um, Dowden's on his feet. We shall cross live to the House of Commons, of course, when... Angela Rayner gets to hers. And it it is, I mean, she is, I think, a more effective PMQ's operator than Starmer, according to the traditional measures. She's Mm. she's more fiery. She gets a bit more emotional. She's she's a bit more given to the rhetorical flourish, perhaps, than than Keir Starmer is. It's been a while. I can't remember the last time she was. 29th of March, I think. was when her her final clash with Dominic Raab. So, yeah, quite a while. It doesn't happen often. That's why they like to sort of take, Angela Rayner's team like to take the moment, make the most of it. They always give us some pretty good one Liners. It's always pretty feisty and fiery, James, as you say, as an exchange. And I'm sure no doubt will be, today will be no different. Oliver Dowden really will want to come out the traps flying. First one at PMQs will want to show that Rishi Sunak's vindicated in nominating him rather than any of the other senior cabinet ministers do it. He's on his feet. I think it's going to be quite a good one. Cool. We shall, um, we shall cross immediately. We'll run out of things to suggest that might come up. Keith, any thoughts? No, Keith's got nothing. Anyone else? Any texts? Anyone? What else are we looking for? Why is it taking so long? It's, it's two minutes past 12. Could have gone to the news. Backbenchers are rambling Back on. Backbenchers are rambling on. So we will do what we always do, take it live, and then pull out after Stephen Flynn. Does, it, does Stephen Flynn still does his bit, or does he hand over to he a He normally deputy? hands over. He hands over to a deputy as well, um, and then come back and pick over the bones of, of what, what has been said and done. Just to recap, we're probably going to hear... 
about housing. We may hear about food inflation and food prices. It would be surprising if Jacob Rees-Mogg's admission that the Conservatives deliberately set out, and of course he was a minister when this policy was formed, yeah, wasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. He's part of the cabinet that pushed it through. It yep. was on Johnson's watch. Yep. Whew. Um, have a look at that, see what Dowden has to say about that, because he can hardly, well, I don't know, can he shoot the messenger? Can he he'll just, he'll just say, source? I totally disagree, and this is wrong. That's and not what happened at all. But it's, it's difficult when he's a former cabinet minister. Will he be in the house today, or is he too busy on the telly? Or do, OK, let's go. Here it is. Angela Rayner on her feet. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and it's a pleasure to welcome yet another Deputy Prime Minister to the dispatch box. The third deputy that I've faced in three years. And you know what they say, the third time's a charm. And, and I'm also pleased to note, Mr Speaker, that the Prime Minister has a working class friend, finally. <laughs> I seem to remember that after the loss of 300 Conservative seats at last year's local elections, the Right Honourable Gentleman resigned, saying someone must take responsibility. After a thousand more Conservative councillors have been given the boot by voters, who does he think is responsible now? Mr Speaker, in, the, in the, the spirit of the Right Honourable Lady's opening remarks, can I just say it really is a pleasure to see the Right Honourable Lady here today. I was, though, expecting to face the Labour leader's choice for the next Deputy Prime Minister if they win the election, uh, so I'm surprised that the Lib Dem leader isn't taking questions today. <laughs> Forgive me if I take the right honourable lady's predictions with a pinch of salt. After all, she confidently predicted that the right honourable member for Islington North would one day be Prime Minister. Remember, this is a man who wanted to abolish the army, scrap Trident, withdraw from NATO, and abandon Ukraine. And what did she say to that? She couldn't wait for him to be Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, it's absolutely amazing that while the Labour Party is preparing to govern with a Labour majority, his party is, is starting to prepare for opposition, Mr Speaker. And this week at the National Conservative Conference, a member for Devisers blamed the country's problems on a new religion. He even hit out at the dystopian fantasy of John Lennon. The member for Pentastone and Stockbridge said identifying falling birthing rates is the overarching threat to the UK. She criticised woke well, teaching in for destroying children's souls and causing self-harm and suicide among people. And the right honourable member for North East Somerset really let the cat out the bag when he said parties that try to gerrymander end up finding their clever schemes come back to bite them, as dare I said we found when in in insisting on voter ID. The right honourable gentleman opposite, while working in number 10, said he had to listen to the radio every morning to find out what was really going on in the country. Apparently, he was surprised on a daily basis by what he learned, and most of his time was spent on day-to-day -day crisis management. Eleven years on, Mr Speaker, nothing has changed. I'm not quite sure what the question was then, Mr Speaker. But uh, if she wants to talk about this, all, this sort of thing, we all know what's going on with her and her leader. It's all lovey-dovey on the surface. They turn it on for the cameras, but as soon as they're off, it's a different story. They're at each other's throats. Mr Speaker, they're the Phil and Holly of British politics. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The reality is, after 13 years of Tory rule, they're still lurching from crisis to crisis and wallowing in their own mess. They can't solve the crisis because they are the crisis. The Honourable Member opposite should take more note of what's happening at his conferences in his party before trying to make up what's happening in mine. The Prime Minister pledged that by March NHS waiting lists would fall. 
It's now May. So can he tell us, since he made that pledge, is the number of people waiting on late waiting lists higher or lower? Mr. Mr. Speaker, we are making good progress, for example, with two-year waiting lists. But the Right Honourable Lady seems to forget a crucial fact. The United Kingdom experienced an unprecedented pandemic. Right before COVID, GP satisfaction was high. Delayed discharges were half. Ambulance targets were being met. And she knows that right now, in Labour-run Wales, exactly the same challenges are being faced. The difference between us is, on this side of the House, we've got a plan to fix it, while she's too busy playing petty politics. Mr Speaker, even before the pandemic, waiting lists were going up. So it doesn't wash that this government, after 13 years in power, is blaming everybody but themselves for what people are having to put up with. He appears to be claiming that 11,000 patients waiting more than 18 months is an achievement. The last Labour government reduced waiting times from 18 months to 18 weeks, and he can come back to me when he's achieved that. The fact is, Mr Speaker, waiting lists are longer than when the Prime Minister made his pledge five months ago. The number of people in England waiting to start hospital treatment is the highest since records began. 7.3 million patients left waiting. Now, I know the Prime Minister has his own private GP, so maybe he doesn't appreciate the urgency, but he's left people like my constituent, Carol, waiting for over a year for an urgent appointment, moved from waiting list to waiting list with appointments cancelled again and again. So if not now, when will waiting order, lists order, fall? Order. It'll continue till I hear the end of this question. The more, <laughs> if I get any more interruptions, it will take longer. Angela Ray. Mr Speaker, they don't want to hear the question because they know the answer. They know the answer is that they failed the British people. So when will waiting lists fall? <laughs> Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I would gently say to the Right Honourable Lady that if she cares that much about access to our health care, why is she opposing our minimum service levels? They will provide core emergency services with vital cover during health care strikes. Does she not think that vulnerable patients deserve that level of care, or is she too weak to stand up to her union paymasters? Mr Speaker, we all, we all want minimum service levels. It's this government. It's this government that have failed to provide minimum service levels in all of our trains, in all of our public services, because they've run them down and mismanaged them for the last 13 years. Now, it's not just waiting times, Mr Speaker. 13 years after the landmark Marmot review into child poverty, Sir Michael says this government is on track to make child poverty worse with more than a quarter of our children living in poverty last year. When I was a young mum, I remember the sick feeling in my stomach not knowing if my wages would cover the bills. Yet his government has taken a wrecking ball to measures by the last Labour government to eradicate child poverty, even abolishing the child poverty unit. They tried to justify this by saying they no longer needed a child poverty unit because they've abolished the child poverty targets. So can he tell us? What level of poverty he considered to be a success? I'd say to the right hon. Lady, this comprehensive schoolboy is not going to take any lectures from the party opposite about the lives of working people. What I would say is that we have introduced record increases in the national living wage, something that this party introduced, the party opposite failed to do so, and we have taken one million working age people out of poverty altogether. That is the record of my party, and one of which I am very proud. Mr Speaker, the last Labour government made it their mission to reduce the number of children in poverty by a million. We achieved that. 
Under the Tories, child poverty is nearly back to the level it was when Labour last inherited the Tory mess. Yep. After 13 years of the Tories, they are stuck in a conveyor belt of crisis. And while his party is preparing for opposition with their Trump Tribute Act conference over the road, <laughs> Labour are focused on fixing the real problems facing British people. The Tories have picked their side. They're for the vested interests, for the oil companies and the bankers, for those that are profiting from the crisis and not suffering from it. Whether it's failing the millions of people anxiously waiting for treatment or overseeing a rise in child poverty. And while these colleagues spout nonsense at their carnival of conspiracy, I want to know when will his party stop blaming everybody else and realise that the problem is them? Mr Speaker, I will proudly defend our record in office. Crime down 50%, near record levels of employment, a record minimum wage. And what, Mr Speaker, what's their record? Four general election defeats, 30 promises already broken, and one leader who let anti-Semitism run wild. That is why the British people will never trust the Labour Party. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Would my right hon. Friend please send his condolences to the family of Hilton Ward Councillor Gillian Lemon, who at the young age of 52 tragically died partway through the election count on Friday. This means that the whole election for all three councillors has had to be voided, even though the returning officer was ready to declare three Conservative councillors for the Hilton Ward. Perhaps following this dreadful experience, my right hon. Friend will confirm that the best way to thank Councillor Gillian Lemon for her service is for the good people of Hilton Ward in South Derbyshire to vote again three times for the three Conservative candidates on Thursday the 15th of June. Well, Mr Speaker, may, may I extend uh, my deepest sympathies on behalf uh, of these benches and the Conservative Party to Councillor Gillian Lemon's family. We all know how incredibly hard local councillors work, and she was a strong representative of South Derbyshire. And like my honourable friend, I do hope that the people of Hilton Ward will reflect on this by voting for Conservative candidates at the forthcoming election. We now come to the Deputy Leader of the SNP, Murray Black. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In 2016, the Deputy Prime Minister told his constituents in a blog that it was his duty to, and I quote, furnish them with all the facts that are available with regards to Brexit. Today, Brexit Britain faces higher food prices, a lack of workers, a shrinking economy, and a decline in living standards. Why is he happy to ignore those facts? Yeah. Yeah. The Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, we have one of the fastest growth rates in the whole of the G7 since Brexit. And we, the, we, all, we all know, and in fairness, we all know the policy of the SNP. And they said it this weekend, I quote, we need to undo Brexit. But let me tell you, if I were them, I'd start by undoing the mess they've left Scotland in and start working with the United Kingdom government and focus on the priorities of the Scottish people, not the priorities of their party. Yeah. Yeah. Black. Check the deep. Mr Speaker, the, the only <laughs> thing more deluded than that defence of Brexit is the Labour Party's support of it. <laughs> now, just today, the world's fourth largest car manufacturer said that Brexit was, and again I quote, a threat to our export business and the sustainability of our UK manufacturing options. Even Nigel Farage can admit that Brexit has failed. So, Mr Speaker, why can't he? Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Prime Minister. I I would say to the Honourable Lady, one of the best ways of getting behind industry in this country is get behind the trade deals we are striking with many countries around the world, which they have singularly failed to oppose. And, And I see last week... The SNP promised to build a new Scotland. I don't know whether she's aware, but the SNP have been in power for 13 years. Perhaps they should, they should stop their focus on independence and focus on the priorities of the Scottish people. Yeah. Mr. McBee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
My constituency has a problem with travellers. My constituency has a problem with travellers pitching on private land and common land and oh, causing Lord a nuisance currently um, on Park this is Mike Lake Lake. Industrial Estate in Luxford. <laughs> it's 17 Either minutes after 12. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Just looking at my bingo card there, we kind of forgot that Murray Black was likely to go in on Brexit and Vauxhall. But we, we, we'll see what Ben Kentish got right and what I got wrong after this. 20 minutes after 12 is the time and uh, you're listening to James O'Brien, joined by Ben Kentish to pick over the bones of PMQs. Uh, did you get anything right, Ben? Uh, no, James. We Fantastic. came up with about no, 20 only politicians topics. Could she, be so with, she came up with two different ones. Yes, <laughs> no housing. This um, week. But she did, as I suggested, she might re- reference some of these outrageous outbursts or and or associations undertaken by relatively senior Conservative MPs. But we should begin with an overview. That I mean, certainly for the first half, that was among the worst I've ever seen PMQs. I thought, to, can I be totally honest, it was yeah. absolutely dire. Yeah. I thought Angela Rayner failed to land a blow. Oliver Dowden sort of batted them away, but really didn't look particularly assured or particularly impressive either. It was really, really low standard. Why was he talking about Jeremy Corbyn in answer to the first question? I it's have, usually a sign of desperation. It's, it's, it's Sunak's on the road. He was reading sort it. of break glass yeah. release. He was the reading Ghost it. of Corbyn. He'd had a script that he was determined to read out right. whatever was asked. Uh, Angela Rayner asking about the local council elections and Oliver Dowden's resignation under Boris Johnson for council election results that were uh, worse. Uh, sorry, yes. not, were, were not as bad as the ones that we've had. Uh, in the last few weeks, slight difference, James, was Oliver Dowden was chairman of the Conservative Party with yes. actual responsibility for these things back when he resigned, whereas now he's Cabinet Office Minister with not so much responsibility. But you're right, in, in response, he read out a script about the things that Jeremy Corbyn said he wanted to do and Angela Rayner's insistence that Jeremy Corbyn uh, should and would be the next Prime Minister. It didn't relate to the question at all. It didn't work. But then the question particularly wasn't the best in the first place either. It was really, really low cut standard all round. And, and the second intervention from Angela Rayner felt like a speech. It didn't have, it just wasn't it. I don't question. think there was a question mark. Well, it'd be interesting to see whether Hansard have a question mark <laughs> yes, at the end of that. I, I don't see how they can, <laughs> because right. there was nothing resembling a question in it. It was a sort of rambling uh, monologue about the failures of the Tory government, as Angela Rayner saw them, and Oliver Dowden responded, saying, I don't think there was a question in there. No? It was really strange. It was really strange, James, not to sort of... Was well, it rush of blood to the head territory, do you think? Because they don't get... I mean, she doesn't get it very often, and... and Therefore, on this occasion, she was trying to cram a quart into a pint pot. Yeah, she was trying it, to do yeah, too much in, right. the, in the time available. It felt to me like her and her team had sat down and said, yeah. right, what can we ask? They'd had about five topics banded around and mm. someone had said, oh, well, hang on, why don't we just go with all of them? Mm. And, and and in the end, you were right. She talked quite a lot about the, the National Conservatism Conference and the things that Jacob Rees-Mogg and Daddy Kruger and Miriam Cates, Tory MPs, had said at that conference. But... It didn't form a question. It was mm. sort of shoehorned into mm. her questions about the Tories' records or NHS waiting. I think the point she was trying to make was that rather they're sort of talking to themselves yes. and attending these, you know, quite right-wing uh, sort of US-style, Republican Party-style conferences when they should be getting on with managing the country and they should be getting on with tackling child poverty and the NHS waitings. But that wasn't really made clear in her questions at all. And so it just felt slightly sort of tangential to the points she was trying to make. Julie wonders whether Sunak has picked Dowden to do this in order to make himself look less bad. Could be said of both leaders today, I think, to be fair. Probably could. Um, Although this text disagrees, Angela Rayner should lead the Labour Party. She has so much fire and delivers it 100 times better than Starmer. Um, And now, a little earlier than usual, but partly for the reasons that you have already picked apart, we we turn to Mari Black, standing in for Stephen Flynn as the leader of the SNP. And I don't know if you were listening to this show yesterday, but we we crossed a bit of a Rubicon. I've obviously in the past I have been known to talk about Brexit a bit, Ben. Have you? And I have also created a safe space for people who are re- regretting or even perhaps repenting their vote in 2016. But yesterday was different. Yesterday, after Farage came out and said it was a failure, the what is usually a trickle was quite a flood, and it it speaks to the fact that Murray Black went straight in on it mm. and Labour still can't go near it. Yep. And, and Angela, as I say, Angela Rayner could have done because mm. Keir Starmer has been very clear today that Labour wants to renegotiate the deal. So at some point, at some point, James, surely Labour is going to have to feel comfortable, yeah. confident 
in expressing what its policy is, which is we're not leaving, we're not rejoining the single market and the customs union, but we do want to renegotiate, renegotiate the deal to make it work better. Which is a, you know... We're going to end up in it. It's a clear policy. In in all but name, I think. Because I can't... I mean, looking at the rules of origin stuff, it's not quite as simple as as Brexit's broken the the, the car industry. Not least because the electric car Mm. industry is, is constantly evolving. But... But they're going to, I mean, quite, why would the EU reopen negotiations with a third country at all unless there was meaningful movement on the table from Labour's point of view? But there would there would have to be, and that might partly explain why they're so reluctant to talk about it, because yeah. it begs the question, OK, what are you going to give away? Yeah. And that even, I What's thought it was... in it for us? It's the first thing you say when you sit down at that kind of negotiation. It was why, you know, this, this caution, this sort of paranoia almost about talking about it was what made Keir Starmer's sort of semi-announcement about giving EU citizens uh, voting rights this weekend slightly surprising, because it goes very much against the direction of travel that Labour's mm. basically trying to reassure everyone at every step that there will be no backsliding on Brexit. Then he comes out and, and sort of says that leaves the door open to the attack, that that is the first step towards a sort of much closer relationship with Europe. And yet, even then, James, seemed to back away from it, seemed mm. to back away from it today, saying it's not policy, you know, it's not a priority, and so on. So even when they do come out with something that it seems like a sort of clear step in the direction of a more, uh, yeah. a closer al- alliance with Europe, Within days, they've they've seemed to back away from. It. I, I suppose in the defence of the, the 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 policy tactic, call it what you will, the, it's the Ming vase across the ice rink territory, really, isn't it? And why would he draw attention to it if everything at the moment, the numbers are right back up, aren't they? To, they are, to where they were before yep. that so so called yep. wobble. Um, why draw attention to something that does remain toxic? It doesn't land like it used to, though. There's a couple of things that Dowden did there. The first was. I mean, references to, to Brexit as, as being people might want to reverse it. I, I mean, it might play well with conservative backbenchers. It clearly doesn't play well with the country because the polling is there to show the numbers yep. that want to return, never mind renegotiate. And then with Murray Black, he talks about them having been in power for 13 years. And, I mean, I did a double take at that point. Do you think he did? He, he had that little kind of, oh, God, I just said that out. What a, what a mo. Why, why? Because, of course, for, for anyone not paying attention, so have the Tories. Yes. It, was a, it was a slightly strange thing to say, as was, I think, this line about the fastest growth in the G7, when the, the prediction is for the slowest growth, not in the G, G7, but in the G20 next year. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and as Murray Black pointed out, we were looking through the, the biggest fall in living standards on record, food prices we learned this week going up and up. She pointed out the sluggish economy, the shortages of workers. And those are the sort of problems that people are feeling. Those are the problems that people are experiencing. So I do yeah. think this sort of statistical defence... Well, it's not true either. G7, Ed, Ed Conway has it, picked it up. Flat. Ed Conway at Sky has picked up on this. It's technically true if you're talking exclusively about the 2022 calendar year. Mm. But it's not true. In fact, Ed describes it as total nonsense if you're talking about the post-pandemic period in which UK actually has the slowest growth yeah. in the G7. And it's palpably false if you're talking about any quarter in 2023. Yeah. So, uh, and that was quite Johnson-y. 0.3% was growth in, mm. in, in, the, in the first quarter of this year. As I say, on the forecast for the coming year are the slowest growth in the G20. But I, I also just think, James, politicians using those sort of statistics when we, you know, we've seen a huge rise in yeah. people going to feel, yeah, that's a really it, good point. it doesn't relate to what people are feeling. No. And the risk is that when you say, look how fast our economy is growing and actually people are feeling something very, very different, it just looks out of touch. I always think it's much better for, for the government to say, look, we, you know, we've, we've been through a pandemic, we're yeah. coming out the other side, we appreciate things difficult that's why we've got a plan for x y and z but almost that line about sort of dismissing the problem or pretending there isn't one i never think it rishi Sunak does it too i I never feel that it lands particularly well yeah that's a very very good point and i mean you can you can whether the statistics are accurate or not if you're marveling at how much a pot of butter costs Mm -hmm. now you're literally standing at the at the checkout in the supermarket, wondering how the hell it can be eight quid more than it was last week. Yeah. Then Oliver Dowden standing there and, and manipulating statistics, even if they were true, even if they were the best statistics in the world, it's not going to wash at all, is it? Because that's how people are measuring the the economy. And he could have said, look, we know times are tough. That's why we've invested billions of pounds in energy support. Yeah. He could have tried yeah. to do that. But I think just dismissing it with some sort of statistic that, as I say, it doesn't really relate to, well, it doesn't really relate to fat, let alone what people are experiencing. It, it, it just didn't work. Very strange. Um, another uh, slight challenge to our analysis of <laughs> the keys, although... Um, and Luke sometimes gets in touch to tell me his thoughts. He says, I thought that was a very good PMQs for Labour. It was a full 
PMQs where your general person could fully understand everything. From where I'm standing, Angela Rayner literally picked up the Tory party and mopped the toilets with them, while all the Conservatives could do was drag up stuff from 20 years ago or Jeremy Corbyn. It means the Conservatives are dead in the water. Um, Paul takes the analogy a little further and says, down and opting for the Norwegian blue parrot defence. I, for the record, I'm with Ben. I thought that certainly the first half of that was dismal, but, um, you know, you see what you see. Amelia Cox, thank you, Ben Kentish. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. Hello, it's 12.34 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC where we, well, I don't know what we're going to do next. What do you fancy? There's been a remarkable uh, contribution to that committee inquiry that I told you about into the policing of the coronation that I want to play to you in full um, because I, I, I mean, it is pretty chilling what went on and not, not with regard to Republic, the anti-monarchy protesters. That was chilling enough. But the Westminster uh, group that... Wears, I mean, you'll hear the detail shortly. It, it wears tabards featuring the Metropolitan Police logo, and and still they were locked up on what seems to me to be um, the basis of a Mail on Sunday front page that was probably a flyer anyway. Night Stars, the group is called. They were arrested the night before the coronation, even though their high visibility jackets displayed the Met Police logo. What one of their members, uh, Susie Melvin, has been talking to the. It's Westminster City, no, she's from Westminster City Council and she's been talking to the um, select committee looking at the policing of the coronation um, in the last couple of hours. I think I'll play you that in full. And then I'm going to do, what well, we need to come up with a crass name for this part of the programme, the sort of Wednesday flyer or something. Like, after PMQs, I've got this weird chunk of time free. We could go back to the facial recognition conversation, but I think Hamid... He kind of killed it, didn't he? I mean, <laughs> when, when someone that's represented the Uyghur people uh, in, in, in sort of international tribunal level explains to you what the Chinese government has been doing with facial recognition technology, my sort of, my pretty poor attempt to play the if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear card looks even more ridiculous than it did at the start. So I don't think we can do that. I don't think we've got time to look at why... Uh, English school children are now among the best readers in the world. We've gone up four places. We don't go up on any tables, really. We're actually 20th on the forecast of the economy. We're, we're below Russia on the forecast, the IMF forecast of what our economy is going to do in the G20. I say that again, we're below Russia. And listen, none of these forecasts are fallible, infallible, just ask Michael Fish, but a, a, a sensible government would at least be paying attention to them. So the news that we've gone up on um, a really good list uh, you, you, you've got a high the fourth i think the fourth highest level of reading in the in the world now the highest in europe and that um uh, follows it is being suggested that is a consequence of the success of phonics which we had quite a lot of fun talking about on the program without ever really getting to the bottom of of what it all meant does that count as another victory for michael gove i wonder that perhaps it does but that's not the story i want to talk about either the story i want to talk about and i'm, I'm going to need you now to tell me what happened. So this is going to be teachers and parents, I think. Um, so year six is 10 and 11-year-olds, isn't it? Uh, and on, on Wednesday, 10 and 11-year-olds up and down this country sat an exam, a so-called SATS exam, that was apparently absolutely apocalyptic. There, there were children weeping, wailing, and I, have it, I am reliably informed, gnashing their teeth. And so much so that the school's minister has now uh, pledged to intervene. He's going to have a look at what happened. Hundreds of parents and teachers complained that the exam was simply too difficult. Schools said it was so tricky that uh, even staff failed to understand the questions. The English reading test, remember, for 10 and 11-year-olds included GCSE level questions. Even the highest ability pupils were unable to finish the paper and I want to know what happened I'd quite like you to test me on some of the questions as well if you've got the paper handy but this is for teachers and parents 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need um, I don't have time to set this up with a lengthy monologue and even if I did what would I say in a lengthy monologue about an exam I haven't sat or seen I uh, only heard about it in the news but the SATS exam on Wednesday was an absolute killer and I want to know what happened to your your kids. I mean, why was it so tough? 
How, how many questions have we got here? How tough was it? 03456060973. Why was it so tough? 03456060973. And in a sense, why does it matter? Because everyone sat the same exam. So the, the, the grade categories will reflect that. So, you, you know, even if nobody got more than 50%, you're still going to come top of the class if you got 49%, aren't you? So how bad was it? And, and why did this happen? Did your child come home on Wednesday in tears or in pieces because their SATS exam was so hard? Um, if you don't phone me about this, if it turns out that it's a little bit of media scaremongering, I'm not quite sure what we'll do. Um, I, I possibly return to some elements of, of what's been going on in the House of Commons. But I just want to know how horrible, how, how, how your little... And I have enormous sympathy. I don't think that murderous exams do kids any good at all. It's something else I've changed my mind about over the years because I, I was very much someone who did good at exams and could mess around for the rest of the year. But, of course, that's a really tiny category of pupils and the system should be designed for the greater good, for the for the majority. Um, I will accept grandparents as well on this question, 03456060973, but I don't want calls from people telling me how well their children did in it, unless I have to. Um, let's find out. Okay? But here is the... Uh, uh, Night Stars volunteer, and I think possibly she also works for Westminster City Council, Susie Melvin, describing the arrest of volunteers the night before the coronation, even though their high visibility jackets displayed the Met Police logo. I'm just getting a couple of complaints. I, yeah, you're quite right. If your children found it really easy, of course I should take your call as well, because the story might be nonsense. And normally we're quite well attuned to spotting um, exaggerations, embellishments or nonsense stories. So if the school's minister is saying the test is too hard, I, I'm not going to use the word snowflake, but what was your experience of this test on Wednesday that apparently had loads of people, loads of little ones in tears? But first, Susie Melvin talking, talking to the Select Committee today about this astonishing arrest at the coronation, just before the coronation. So we started walking towards Soho and Soho Square is always the last area that we would patrol because there's often people waiting for taxis on their own there and a large part of our role is trying to keep people safe particularly towards the end of a night out so if we see people who are on their own waiting for an Uber say we'll offer to wait with them so that they can feel safer and they're not at risk of sort of incurring any crime. Um, so as we were entering the north side of Soho Square, we were approached by a number of TSG vans um, and then a, a large number of officers got out of vans and they approached us and um, said that they were going to stop and search us. So we were kept separate and um, the officers looked through our bags, checked our pockets, um, we explained to them who the night stars were, um, showed them emails from Westminster City Council, um, showed them the night stars website, um, we gave them leaflets which had been printed by Westminster City Council, um, our high visibility vests which do display the Met Police logo as well because we're in partnership with the Met Police, have a QR code on them which links back to the Westminster City Council website right, as well. Just Sorry to interrupt you. Did you say then you're in partnership? You work in partnership with the Metropolitan yeah. Police? Yes. Okay. Right. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, no problems. Um, so we, we did the, the best that we could to try and explain who we were to the officers. Um, and then they also searched the church that we um, based ourselves out of. Um, and we were then taken in police vans to, well, we were told we were going to be arrested and taken in police vans to Woolworth um, Police Station um, where we were held. Um, I was interviewed at approximately one o'clock in the afternoon the following day and then we were released a little bit after four o'clock on Saturday the 6th of May. <coughs> Goodness, that's such a long time for you to be detained. Yes, it was, yeah. Right, Okay. I'm a bit speechless, actually, mm. having heard that account uh, of what happened to you mm. and your colleagues. Right. I am too. That's an absolutely remarkable uh, description of, of policing. But I said to you at 11 o'clock, the sense that, oh, it's a one-off coronation means that the police can go a little bit further or do a little bit more than they normally would. Um, I, 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 let me get this. I've, I've, I've set up one of the worst topics in the history of my radio presenting career here. I, it's no, no, I have. Literally everybody is saying that it was easy. So the Daily Mail is reporting, and other newspapers, Minister Vowell's probe into SATS exam that left children in tears. 
And all I'm getting is people telling me that their kids found it quite easy. Here's, here's one. This is um, Hannah, who's in Kirby Stephen. My 11-year-old found it fine, James, as did her pals. In fact, I've not spoken to any year six parent who said their kids found it problematic. The only paper she found tricky was Friday's reasoning paper. Where has this story come from? 0345 6060973 is the number you need. I'll play you another clip and then we'll hit the phones. Uh, Simone and Mike up first, both of whom I think telling me that their kids found it really easy. Um... I want, I, there's been a, an intervention. Uh, well, Matt Twist, the temporary assistant commissioner, was talking at this select committee. Um, it, it's quite funny that they're, they're discussing or they're investigating the policing of protests, and appropriately enough, someone turned up to protest. The combination lock is part of them, so it sort of links together and then there's a combination on it. So it would have been unusual, which I think is why um, it would have aroused suspicion of the officers. You usually use a combination lock to stop. Oh, We're here today because of democracy. Come on, come on, officer. Come on, officer. No, we're not having this. Come on, officer. Hmm. I, I think that was 30 B. Lee, was it, in the middle of it, judging, judging by the accent? He, he later asked Graham Smith from Republic, if you embrace democracy so much, why don't you put your placards away and stand for election? And 30 P. Lee is off to the Nazi rally later this afternoon, where presumably he will say to all the speakers there, whether they're trivialising the Holocaust like Douglas Murray or um, uh, coming out with some frankly astonishing, astonishing bile like David Starkey, he'll tell them to shut up, will he? And run for Parliament. Because the logic of telling Graham Smith that he should stop running Republic and run for Parliament instead would be the same for anyone holding a political opinion. Unless, of course, he's too thick to understand the words coming out of his own mouth, which is the alternative reading of this situation. Uh, the Sats. Loads of people ringing me to tell me how easy it was. I, I, I don't know how this could have backfired worse, to be honest. 12.49 is the time. Minister vows probe into Sats exam that left children in tears. This was the Year 6 English exam on Wednesday that teachers and hundred well parents have complained was impossibly difficult. Uh, I, I'm struggling to find anyone who agrees. Uh, know your audience, James. Your listeners are a cut above. Their kids are likely to follow suit. I quite like that, but it, it must be true. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the newspapers. James, my son found the reading paper difficult. He ran out of time with seven questions left to answer. Many mums on our class chat mentioned children in tears as they found it so difficult and another my 11 year old daughter found it very difficult as did her friends they've completed all the past papers from 2017 and scored almost full marks but she couldn't finish large parts of wednesday's test so what on earth is going home uh, going home what on earth is is going on um john in northumberland says thank goodness for you james i was beginning to worry my 11 year old came home on wednesday and said it was fine he even chatted about the subject of the reading and comprehension test as finding it interesting it was about bats apparently he also said he finished a bit early since all this fuss i've been wondering whether he stuffed it up to such an extent that he's not even realized i did that once in a geography exam i always remember that i thought i'd aced it absolutely smashed it and i came second bottom from class. Um, I, I can't quite remember why, but I, I, oh, I remember why. I was, t I was eight, eight or nine, and I wrote loads. And I thought you'd come top if you wrote the most. I wrote about 14 pages in a geography exam, gave it to the major, uh, who was my geography teacher at the time, head of class in 4B. And I said, but I started boasting. I was very different in those days. Started boasting about it. And I remember when he came back in with the results the next day, he, 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 he looked at me with such a mixture of pity and amusement. I've never forgotten the expression on his face. I'm doing it in ascending order. So they start with who came bottom of the class, which uh, I think was a kid called Bailey. I always remember him. He told us he was half Scottish, half French, half English and half Welsh. And we, even at that age, uh, we realised there was something mathematically impossible about that. So Bailey came bottom, and then me, second bottom. Despite um, Anyway, so I know what you mean, John. You can't be certain at this stage that your lad didn't muff it up, but muffed it up so badly he thought he'd done, he thought he'd done well. So what is going on with this story? Simone is in Harrow to make sense of everything. Simone, what would you like to say? Hi, James. I'm standing here laughing. Um, I identical twin boys in year six go to a normal local state school. Yes. And they finish their sats on Friday, followed by a pizza party. Oh, lovely. They, they loved it. They enjoyed the week so much. Um, they found it easy. But I have to say the school did revise a lot. They came in the first week of the Easter holiday. Gosh. They came in on the, the half term and they for three hours from nine till 12. They did loads of past papers. I would test you, but I've been them all now. Oh. Um, 
But I have to say, they did find them easy, and they mm. are quite bright, but a lot of the mixed abilities, a lot of their friends said that, that it wasn't as bad as they thought it was going to be. So what's so going on? Heard, well, well, I, mean, I is don't it, know. Is it all the I same think... exam board? It's the Standards and Testing Agency. It's this, yeah. Everyone sits the same paper. It's not like GCSEs where you can sign up with a different board, I don't think. I don't understand. I, I, I mean, I, I, I asked them about the reading one, and they said, yes, it was a tiny bit more challenging than the arithmetic, maths, and the reasoning, but it, it, it still was easy. One of my twins finished it in 20 minutes. How long is it supposed to take? Uh, maybe 45 or so. Blimey. Got a couple of geniuses on your hands. <laughs> when do you get the results? Because I'm, I'm now thinking July of John... July the 11th. Jul- I think July... The, the only thing I say, because I've got a daughter doing first year A-level, the only thing kind of we both said was maybe they should give the answers earlier. Because they're small, it's a bit cruel to make them wait, but maybe they have to get used to it for secondary school. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Have you seen the story? Have you heard that it was supposed to be? I have, and, and I and I and I asked them. I said, yeah. you know, they're very, they're switched on. They love, you know, they, sure. I'm listening to LBC all day, so they're used to hearing me. Poor they? kids. And I call said, social <laughs> services. <laughs> and I said, what what happened with the reading? And yeah. they said, what do you mean? I said, everyone, Nick Ferrari, this one, that one, they're all saying it. Right. Um, I'll tell them about you later. When oh, don't worry. Up. No, let them let them stay on in, in blissful ignorance about my existence, <laughs> Simone. Wait but, until wait until the summer holidays. Well, okay. So one down. Um, uh, no sign at all of these these alleged difficulties. Mike's in Harrogate. Mike, what do you reckon? Thank you, Simone. Uh, hi, James. Hello, yeah, uh, ditto, really. Um, is this? this is the worst <laughs> topic ever in the history of phoning uh, radio. I yeah, wanted tales of weeping children. <laughs> my wife, she's a teacher at a small primary school, um, and teaches, you know, year six kids. And my right. my son is year six, and he's just done it. And they both said, yeah, there was the odd question in some of the papers that was a little bit more difficult, but a little bit less difficult. But they're just within the normal parameters of, um, of what they're used to. And, and like Simone, um, uh, the, the, the kids are doing, most schools are doing lots of sort of past papers as practice and stuff. So I, I don't know whether... Some people at some schools maybe they didn't do that, and and um, I think there's an element there if you don't prepare people for. I don't want anyone to feel bad, but then, I hear you. Yeah. But they shouldn't be. I mean, we know we're always. I'll tell you something, Mike, but but you're not allowed to tell anyone else. Mm-hmm. I chose this story because of the headline: ministers yeah. vow, minister vows probe into SATs yeah, exam yeah, that yeah. left children in tears. I didn't read it until I got on air because I've got mm-hmm. that weird Wednesday afternoon thing to do after PMQs where we have to sort of fill a an odd little spot in the program. Um, And then when I started reading it, I got to the third paragraph and it said hundreds of parents and teachers and a little alarm went off in the back of my mind at that point because I thought, if this is a massive story, it's going to be more than hundreds, isn't it? You would think so, yeah, definitely. I think that looks like probably Mm. coming true. So, right, two down, no, 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 no tears. Two down, no tears. Neil's in South Hams. Any weeping children at your end, Neil? (laughs) No, oh, no. My okay. wife's a teacher of fifteen years. She's right. no deputy head. Um, she said it was a little bit dif- more difficult than normal, but oh, she not did the say that paper she's uh, ever seen. Oh, so mm-hmm. a bit, so yeah. a bit harder than average, but not the hardest, as it were. <laughs> yeah. Why uh, isn't that child should, at school? Yeah. Because he's three and I just come home from nursery. Good answer. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, so, I, mean, we, I saw the Nick Gibb thing last night. Right. I heard about it. And uh, I asked her and she said, you know, shrugged the shoulders. Yeah, it was a little bit more difficult than usual, but not the hardest she's ever seen. So, okay. But the, the, your, fundamental, your fundamental problem is, is that parents or, you know, children of parents that have done yeah. this paper 
they've seen one paper or they might have done a few test papers. You know, my wife's seen 15 years' worth. Oh, yeah, that's so, a good point. So you're comparing yeah, it, it to a 15 years. So it might be the hardest out of the last four. Mm. But out of the last yeah. 15, it's um, lots of kids saying they didn't finish. Uh, and, and I'm not hearing any evidence of that either. So, well, OK. Yeah. I won't be doing this again. Thank you, Neil. Uh, any chance? Any light? We got any any more calls? Uh, Linda's in Dartford. Any tears where you were, Linda? Any weeping children? Mm. No, no. Our fond oh, grandmother here. We were collecting right. her grandson on the day. And I he don't... came out with his normal diffident air. And then I heard the stuff about, oh, well, they, they were really upset. Yeah. And I was like... Well, either he's majorly stuffed up or he's been fine. He's not touched the <laughs> side, he's not noticed how bad, but no, he's done well, has he? He thought he'd done well, he thinks he's done well. Yeah, he said, oh, it was fine, it was fine. Well, this the is subject. the worst phone in ever. I'm very Isn't sorry. It? That's all right. I'm, I'm glad you're here, Linda. I don't want to sound ungrateful, but what an no, absolute no. dog's dinner this has turned out to be. Well, exactly. Honestly, exactly. right than that, sheesh, I'll probably do parking tickets tomorrow or something like very, that. Just yeah. to... Very tabloid, I'm afraid. I, I know, very. I know. It's not normally my style, this, but it's all <laughs> no, falling no. apart around no, our ears. No, anyway. We haven't seen the results yet, have we? Well, that is we? true. I could, We could still have that last laugh. I mean, not that we you'll could. be laughing if the little lad's absolutely muffed it, but it's it's not beyond the realms of possibility, I suppose. No, no. Linda, take no. care. Thank you. For, thank, thank you for ringing me, because, you know, it's... it's um, <laughs> anyway. It filled a few minutes. It filled a few minutes, Linda. What more can we aim for when we get up absolutely. in the morning, eh? Not it, perfection. No, no. Never let <laughs> perfection be the enemy of the good, Linda. That's no, my no. motto. <laughs> Have a lovely afternoon. Oh, okay, it's almost as bad bye. as almost as bad as PMQs this time. Whose idea was it to talk about this? Well, a load of old. <laughs> it was not my idea. How dare you make this ludicrous suggestion? Um, is that it? Can I go now? What text? This one here. My son ended up in tears. There you go. After reading the sats last week, he didn't get the chance to finish the paper. All the children I spoke to said it was a lot harder than the practice papers. That's from Michelle. And she adds, P.S. I've taught year six for 30 years. Oh, all right, then. Didn't ring me, though, did you, Michelle? Honestly, you can't do a show. It's not a texting show. It's a phoning show. Oh, anyway, that's it from me for another day. We'll do it all again tomorrow morning from 10. You uh, can, of course, catch any of today's show. I wouldn't bother with the last half an hour, if I were you. You can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player. You can rewind live radio. If you listen to the podcast, you can fast forward this bit and go straight to Sheila uh, and enjoy the whole show podcast. You'll also find all LBC's shows there to catch up on, as well as all the best video clips from LBC and other global stations. Rewind live radio on Global Player. Download for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. I rather admire the way you just stuck with it and kept saying how terrible it was. I had to. Yeah. I was watching the clock. I couldn't oh. start a new one, couldn't uh, couldn't change my mind. We'd run out of clips. I had nowhere else to go, Shil. You, you did it well. It was Styled it out, I think. No one noticed how bad it was, did they? I think we got yeah. away with it. I think we did. <laughs> as long as no one was listening, we'd be fine. Oh, yeah. Fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> Thank you, James. 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 Thank you, James.